morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. It's 9.30 a.m. Today is Wednesday, June 3rd. My name is Brian Zumwalt, and I'm the director of the county's Office of Technology and Innovation. I'll be playing the role of technology moderator for today's virtual budget information session. On the panel with me is Don Crow from the county attorney's office, who will be serving as process mo moderator. Before we start the meeting today, uh, let's do a quick roll call, make sure we have all the commissioners with communications, and then I'll hand, I think, over to Barry for an inter introduction. Uh, so let's start with Commissioner Eggers. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Seal. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Welch. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Commissioner Long. Oh, you're muted, Commissioner Long. <laughs> Sorry about that. Leave my button alone, Brian. <laughs> I will, I promise. And Commissioner Gerard. Morning, all. All right, we can get started. It's all yours, Barry. Okay. Um, so obviously the budget staff has been hard at work. OMB has been hard at work looking at preparing the 2021 um, operating capital budget. Over the next you know, couple of weeks, we're gonna present information on each area. One of the areas though, we wanted to slow down and we'll bring back to you in, in July is final recommendations regarding decision packages and um, strategies to address the budget. As we look at the budget, we really, so these are projections and it's very difficult you know, to make those um, in certain areas, it's easier, easier than others. When we get into TDC dollars and bed tax, well, you know, we've got we got some pretty immediate impacts. Others are more long term, and especially when we get around the impacts to the general fund and property taxes in particular. So we're going to break down uh, some of those. We're going to break down the assessments. We want a little bit more time, and we do have time built to the schedule to be able to accommodate um, final review and and give you some. Um, strategies and ideas about how to uh, approach the budget, both for the 2021 budget, um, but with an eye on 2022. Um, obviously, that's going to be fluid. Uh, there's many, many issues that could impact that. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. The other piece that we have been working hard on ever since last year is really trying to dig into um, the analytics of how we make decisions within the budgets. Um, you'll notice within the BCC departments, uh, we did not set budget targets. In other words, um, we didn't give you an automatic growth factor. You know, we expect people to analyze and be um, uh, creative and trying to find the way to provide the level of service at the lowest cost possible. Um, that in seeing the budget to be able to maintain that. And others, you'll see where the budget is actually at or lower than the previous year. And so departments have really done a good job of trying to find ways of looking at their budget through an analytical lens and really have data be a basis for the way in which you make decisions. Um, the final piece is with the our performance management and our data analytics that Aubrey's been and her team's been working so hard on. Um, all the departments have been engaged. They've been working really hard. But, you know, this is something that's going to take time. You'll see areas that are kind of easy. We had the we had the analytics and the measures in place. And so we've been refining those. There's others where they're kind of beginning. Um, uh, and so it's important for them to get a good foundation. We haven't forced this in. I'm always concerned when we say you must do this and you must do this. Well, then you get bad data, you know. And so we've been working uh, with our departments. They've been working as a team with the departments. Um, and in many cases, that's a secondary duty, you know, that you're putting on someone. So they've, they've made a lot of progress. Um, but it's a, it's a work in progress. And so they'll outline kind of where we're at and where we're going with that program. So very, very proud of the team. Very, very proud of the work that they've accomplished to get to this point. Um, you'll see, um, I think this will pay us dividends as we build this out over the next couple of years. Um, and I also asked as part of this presentation that the analysts talk about what they've looked at. That way you get to hear from them. They're the ones working with the departments, looking at various issues seeing the impacts that the department has and the challenges that they have. That's the reason we're going to we're going to focus a lot on their work plan. So it's not just the data, but what is driving their day to day work. That's the, the 98 percent. You get to see the you know, we've got a new mandate or we've got a new this. Well, but there's also things that are driving the way that they do their business. So it's important to be able to outline that as part of their work plan uh, that gives you a sense of priorities of how the department's coming at that. So. Um, and format's a little, 
uh, format's a little bit um, different this year. Um, it's fluid. We have we have plenty of time to be able to do these. I appreciate that you've taken the time. Um, I think it's important. I think it'll give us a good foundation going forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to Cecilia to begin our presentation. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Good morning. Share my screen with you. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. All right. So welcome to FY21 budget development. It's um, been a year that we weren't exactly expecting, but we're adjusting. Let's see. So Barry talked a little bit about this already, so I won't spend too much time there. Um, but the purpose of these budget workshops are to share with you where we are with the budget process, um, what our departments have pulled together so far, and obviously this year with the COVID-19, um, really keeping you updated on how that's impacting our budget for FY20, FY21, and then long-term. So you'll see a few forecast updates um, that look a lot different from what you saw in February. Um, uh, this is the part Barry mentioned as far as the changes from FY20 budget development. There were no targets set for the BCC departments or the independence aid, independent agencies, but the constitutional officers did receive targets. So those are built into their budget requests. Not all uh, constitutional officers increased their budget to the target level, but that will be discussed as we walk through their budgets because you will be hearing from them as well. Uh, the county administrator, depart, uh, county administrator reviewed each of the department and agency budgets uh, with the departments and our budget analyst and scrubbed through those details that he mentioned that we asked to see this year, trying to absorb as much of the inflationary increases that we could, which um, seeing how this year changed from what we were expecting, that was really a, a blessing that we started the budget season off that way, already digging and scrubbing and uh, justifying each of the line items in the budget. Uh, as a, you all are aware, there are no decision packages submitted by the board. Um, however, departments and agencies were still allowed to submit decision packages for consideration. Uh, these are still under consideration. Uh, we will be reviewing those, looking at now that we have our taxable values in, now that we've been able to do um, additional analysis, um, with our budget and what the COVID-19 impacts look like. We will be reviewing these, um, but OMB and the county administration will be reviewing these and coming back in the next few weeks to, to bring recommendations to you on what we feel like um, could be absorbed. And as usual, most of the requests are general funded. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn because our impact our taxable values. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, I need to, can you release the screen so I can? Absolutely, there we go. To be able to share out Mike now. All right, I think you see it. Good morning, Madam Chair and commissioner, commissioners and um, Mr. Administrator. Wanted to, um, this is an interesting year. We don't only have our normal value trends. We also are gonna try to look toward the, towards the future a little bit. Um, crystal ball it as best we can um, based on information we have at present. So let's see, let me get this going. So we'll start with our value trend history here. And like most years, I like to take this all the way back to 2005. So you can see where the last peak was in 07 with just market values, then the trough, and then the gradual rise once again. As you can see, just market values for 2020 based on our, our June 1 estimates um, are, are in excess of 136 billion. When you bring taxable values into the equation, you can see that that's about 91.5 billion. 
obviously the gap between these is a function of exemptions and, and caps. New construction. For our third year in a row, we're just under a billion dollars in new construction. That's right off this right axis here. So I do expect that to likely go down a little bit for, for this next, um, next tax year. New construction for this roll year predominantly is made up of residential, a lot of additions and new construction. Um, we actually had a lot of small infill subdivisions going on scattered around the county. You know, a lot of them are five lots or less, but, but they are there. Um, about 25% of our new construction has been in multifamily, which I'm sure doesn't surprise you driving around the county. And then the balance of that, about 16% is made up of, of various commercial properties. So here overall countywide, here's the general fund estimated increase at this point, it's about 7%. And important to point out to, to our citizens how our value is, is derived. We always have an effective date of value of January 1. So January 1 of 2020, it was our value target date for, for all of our valuation which means we leaned on data from 2019 to arrive at those estimates. Obviously, COVID-19 did not, the first couple cases were not even reported in the state of Florida until March 1. So our values are pre-COVID, but we are analyzing the data all through 2020 because any of those impacts would occur and hit for our January 1 of 2021 valuation. Here's our fire districts, ranging from 4% to 7% roughly, or 8%, I should say, almost nine on, in that case in Leelman. And we do have resources on our website to, to alert our citizens as to how we were approaching valuation, the importance of January 1, as we just discussed, uh, what our actions are going to be going forward. We not only have something similar to this image here that gives them a quick snapshot, but we also have an FAQ that follows on that page that gets a little more in the weeds if they want to, um, to go there. And obviously they could always reach out and contact us. Um, another thing we're doing, we're gonna accept late file homestead exemptions because of COVID-19 all the way up to September 18th of this year, which is um, right up until the, the end of um, BAB filing. So the petition deadline. So we want to um, make sure we give our citizens enough time to, um, to get filed for Homestead if they, if they qualified for it for January 1 of 2020. Uh, I'm gonna stay on the slide for a little bit because I'm gonna start to go into how we did some estimating on what COVID impacts might look like for 2021, which obviously relate, our values for 2021 relate to the FY20, or the FY22 budget. So we'll can, like I said, we'll be, we tr we'll be tracking the market activity through 2020 to ascertain any of these impacts. We feel the property types that will be most impacted our lodging and hospitality, bars, restaurants, multi-tenant retail, um, some office, and there may be some trickle down to some other property types. We're gonna be looking at, at sales and, and bed tax data throughout the year to help us with some of that analysis as well as actual sale transactions. As of right now, we're not projecting any, any change to residential values. We flatline those in our projection for the next next year, but we did apply some discount factors based on a lot of um, uh, real estate publications. I've been tracking my own knowledge within our market area here for a long time. And then knowing these various proper, 
property types and the sensitivity to to what has happened to them related to COVID. So there there have has been a lot of um, survey data published. A lot of it's obviously a lot of it's opinion at this point. There's not a lot of hard data, but there but we do know that we're going to see some rent compression. We know that we're going to see um, rises in vacancy and collection losses and likely some rises in cap rates. So all those things we're gonna, we have to look at closely this year as we go forward. Um, again, residential, there are some wild cards there. While we've seen sales transactions in number go down, you know, our deed flow is down, we've, we've seen these track transactions go down, but median price points um, year over year have not declined at this point, they've actually still risen. Um, so it, right now it's still a seller's market. There's only about two and a half months of supply out there. You need to hit about six months before it flips to a seller's market. Now we could get there, but as of right now, we're not at that point. It would take, it would take a, a continued slowdown in, in the dem sales demand coupled with a kind of a spike in the listing activities because as the demand has, has dropped, we've also seen the new listing activity go down. So supply that supply and demand balance has stayed in check to this point. So we'll be watching that closely as well. Um, but also we think because of these events, we're starting to see more people that, you know, have had some work from home epiphanies. They, they live in the Northeast. Um, they realize that, you know what, I can retire, basically move to Florida five years before I'm actually going to retire and get out of a high tax state, um, sell some expensive real estate, move into something more affordable, uh, go somewhere where they've had less of an outbreak and enjoy some sunshine and, and, and remote in. So there, there are a lot of pluses for our area in that regard that I think will help to insulate our real estate market, particularly on the residential side. So when I plugged in my factors and, and did a projection for 2021, our valuation, I think I showed you earlier, we're projecting countywide a growth rate for this year of about 7%. When I plug in those commercial discount factors, basically it becomes a minus 7%. So it's literally washing out um, any taxable value growth from this year. And granted that's based on what we know right now. And it's, it's a bit of a shoot from the hip. You know, there's not, no hard numbers there. A lot of it's, a lot of it's a, um, an educated, educated guess, so to speak. But, um, you know, that's based on a lot of real, real estate research publications, some industry participant surveys, um, as well as our own knowledge here of our market. Now, jurisdictions with a higher percentage of the most impacted commercial property types could be expected to see a greater taxable value impact. So while the county as a whole, that, that relationship may, may be a wash, you may see that you get out into a uh, beach community that's heavier with hotels that, that are a higher percentage than typical of their taxable value, then you could see a greater impact there. That's just one example. Um, one thing that does help the, the taxable value on the roll is the Save Our Homes cap has what's built into it, uh, what's called the recapture rule. So I want to show you a little bit of that. Uh, first of all, let me, let me touch here before I get in it, because the, the number of homesteaders plays into how the recapture rule works. So we stand right now in Pinellas County, we have about 61% of our residential property owners are homesteaded. So that means they, they benefit from the Save Our Homes cap. And the way that helps them is, if you look at this graphic here, as just market value rises, the, the blue line, their assessed value can only increase at CPI or 3%, whichever is less. So for example, this year, CPI was 2.3%. So they couldn't exceed the 2.3%. So that, that benefits our citizens that, that have um, qualified for homestead exemption in a rising market because they can't, they can't follow the just market value. But then when the market turns as it potentially can here, the blue line here, the just market value would start to drop 
assessed value can actually continue to rise because these two lines have yet to meet. So that can be somewhat confusing for our property owners that are homesteaded if they see their assessed values rising, even if the market is going the other direction. Um, so the way the recapture rule works is that assessed value can continue to rise at CPI or 3% until those two lines meet. Here you can see they meet and then they would ride down together. The, the bottom line is the assessed value can never exceed the just market value. So they could ride down together. And then when the market turns to go back up again, they would start to benefit from that cap again as just, as just market value exceeds the rate of increase of CPI or that 3%. So just wanted to point that out because that helps to insulate some of that impact to the taxable value rule. Couple more labels there. So also I just wanted to make, I've got a couple of slides that follow this that are really the, more there for the commissioners and the, and the public to understand the, um, the constitutional amendment that'll be on the ballot this year related to portability. So we've, um, we've been successful in getting that to the ballot here for uh, the 2020 general election uh, vote. And that was uh, graciously carried by Senator Brandis and, and Rep Roth. And we, uh, that what that will do is basically allow home, it'll give home homeowners that are homesteaded an additional year to port their save our homes benefit from um, one property to the next. The way it works right now is a little confusing because most people think it's from their date of sale that they get two years from date of sale, but it's not, it's always from the preceding January one. So if you sold in January, then basically you get a full two years. But if you sell in December, you've literally already burned your first year. And now you only have a year to replace that homesteaded property or you lose your Save Our Homes benefit. So we thought that was a big disconnect with what the citizens voted on back in 2008 when, when they received portability. And we've seen a, an, an exorbitant amount of people starting to lose Portability. We've had a lot of transactions going on in the recent years, and those port differentials have become bigger than they have in, in many years. And we've, we've seen a um, number of citizens starting to lose those and, and being very confused over that issue. Uh, even our, even our, our realtors were, were confused over that. So we're trying to get that to where it will always be a minimum of two years and up to a maximum of three. So there's a couple more slides in here. I won't go through these in detail, but this explains just some graphics on portability on whether it's a lateral move or an upsize or a downsize in, in the rules that apply. And all that can be handled in our tax estimator if somebody is, is interested. And then there's a couple slides here that shows cur current portability timeframe versus what the um, constitutional amendment would do. And I just found out that's going to be um, amendment five on the ballot this year. And there will be one more um, property tax related amendment on the ballot this year. And it's re related to, to our veterans and surviving spouses. And it would allow a surviving spouse to, um, to receive a, a um, deceased combat veterans exemption. So that is more of an equity thing. There's a, the surviving spouse can receive all the other various veteran benefits except for the one from a um, combat vet, which just wasn't right. So this this will be amendment six on the ballot and that allows um, citizens opportunity to fix that. Um, also, we have a new website coming up. I know we've been talking about it for a while, but it's, it's getting really close and we're excited about it. It's gonna have a lot of great tools for our citizens, our, um, our business owners and, um, and obviously our um, government users. And that pretty much covers everything I have, but happy to field any questions that, that the commission may have. Brian, I, I won't be able to see anybody raising their hand. Okay. <laughs> anybody? Yes, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Mike, thank you for the great presentation. A couple questions. Uh, what's what's your target for the website? Just uh, not a specific date, but <laughs> right. Well, we the beta the beta deadline keeps keeps moving. Um, we're looking at rolling it out in two people. Well, the beta piece we're going to have the real estate tools out there, the searching, but we won't have our homestead exemption piece on un until probably after trim is when we'll roll probably the entire site out. That, that's our target for the whole okay. site. And on the timing um, of when you set the property values in January 1, for example, a commercial property who had a valuation set based on 2019, mm -hmm. uh, say a hotel that was impacted by COVID-19, Right now they're receiving a tax bill based on that value versus the 7% drop, for example, that you mentioned for this year. Is there anything set up in the process to mitigate that or to time their payment? Well, how does that work? Because they're being billed on a value that really doesn't exist anymore. Right. Well, when it comes to how the, the payment scheduling can occur, you know, that's really a, more of a tax collector issue and, and they have the ability to, they have some different programs to, to allow that to be spaced out some, but, you know, basically the trim notices go out in August, the bills go out at the end of October, but then they're not actually due until March of next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just thinking about the timing of that and, mm -hmm. you know, we're already getting questions about that. Right. I'm sure that'll right. be a topic of discussion going forward. Right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Any other questions for Mike? Okay. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. And Bill, are we going straight into budget? Uh, no, Cecilia is going to uh, continue with the okay. budget overview presentation, and then we'll uh, move on to your yeah, budget. You're you're first up, but first she's got to do an overview. But I, I really do appreciate Mike spending a lot of extra effort to try to help project what is a complicated, um, you know, uh, estimate that, but it really helps re us refine the way we approach the budget. So his efforts and his counsel's much appreciated. And, and that'll be a moving target for us. We'll keep updating that constantly, so. Thanks. All right. Okay, Cecilia. I'm coming back. Hang on one sec. Okay, is everybody able to see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to briefly talk about a couple, uh, a few of the funds that are affected by COVID, and um, I'll preface this with all of this will be discussed much more in depth as we uh, talk to the departments responsible for these funds and the budget analysts um, reviewing that. But we wanted to give you a kind of a high level overview before we move into the department discussions. So for the general fund for FY20, the impacts that we're projecting to revenue affect the sales half cent sales tax and revenue sharing. Um, we're projecting about a $12.4 million decrease to the FY20 estimate. And this is actually, uh, with the sales tax and revenue sharing actually make up about 11% of the general fund revenue. And this 12.4% represents about 2% of what we would have projected prior to the COVID-19. Luckily, uh, timing wise, we're receiving a lot of the FEMA reimbursement from Hurricane Irma. So far we've received about 11.9 million in FY20. So that's helping to offset that impact. Uh, so timing is wonderful on that one. Um, and then for FY21, we don't see as uh, sharp of a decrease in the sales tax and revenue sharing. Um, we do see some in a decrease. We are, well, we're projecting that, um, just knowing that this may have lingering effects, but not at the rate of we had in uh, March and April when most things were shut down. Uh, for FY21, we see about a $4 million decrease to the half cent sales tax and revenue sharing combined. And that still, as you'll see in the uh, graph I'm about to show, will still remain over a 15% reserve for 21 uh, with all of our department's re budget requests in there and even with these decreases that we're projecting. 
uh, as far as the expenditures in FY20, we're seeing about an $8 million direct impact to the general fund related to COVID-19. Uh, a lot of this is just all the activation we've had to do, um, purchasing PPE. We are continuing to track all of these costs so that we can submit for reimbursement uh, at, at a at, well, actually, we're going to try to do that periodically so we're not waiting to the end of COVID-19, whenever that may be. And so we should be able to reca uh, recoup some of the losses that we have here. But another thing is that a lot of our um, departments have been able to shift resources that are currently budgeted to uh, uh, offset some of the costs they're incurring. But as the uh, property appraiser just mentioned, the general fund is going to see most of the impact from COVID-19 is expected in FY22. So um, we're trying to project out that in our, um, our general fund forecast. As you will see here, this is assuming the 6% reduction of property values or to the general fund in FY22. So you can see we're still in a strong shape for the general fund. Um, and just to give you a little background on how we're still in strong shape on that, if you recall, I mean, maybe not because it seems like a really long time ago, when we adopted FY20's budget, we actually surpassed our 15% reserve level. And we we're actually a little over 16%. Well, that's very beneficial to us now. Uh, additionally, um, you may recall during our discussions for the forecast in February, we did have a significant lapse rolling over from 19 that we did not program into the budget. That was about $23 million extra. So all of that is helping us stay in good financial shape for the general fund, um, at least as far as we're being able to project right now. So just to orient you to the assumptions you're looking at here. I mentioned in FY22, there would be a 6% decrease. So we're trying to be pretty conservative with what we're um, projecting here. And then in 23, for taxable values, we're trying to slowly uh, increase those back. So that would be in 23, an increase of 1% from 22, uh, a 2% increase in 24, and then 3% increase for 25 and 26. So we did want to... Um, Assume that the market was just going to return to the current shape it's in. We did want to project some growth um, because that 6% drop was pretty sharp. Um, let's see. Excuse me, went in the wrong direction. What we wanted to show you is a um, presentation that you're somewhat familiar with. So while we're in good shape here and we're trying to be very conservative in how we're budgeting, um, some of the things that we're doing, like I said, we're trying to use existing resources to offset what we can with COVID impacts. We're also trying to hold positions open as long as we can when we have vacancies, uh, reevaluate how quickly we need to fill those, or even if we do, um, we still want to make sure we're providing all the services that we're responsible for to the public. But just looking at how we're doing things to try to be very fiscally conservative, because like I said, these are projections, and as the property appraiser said, it's the best information we have at this time, but things are changing quickly. With that in mind, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have decision package requests from our departments and agencies that we're going to be reviewing. So I wanted to show you what I mentioned uh, just briefly is a familiar view is this is what happens if we continue with the prior year trend of decision packages, which we showed you last year was about $7 million a year. Um, obviously, you see we went from a pretty good position with the general fund to not being a negative in FY26. And this is an extreme circumstance, but it is consistent with what we've done in the prior year. So we wanted to put this in here as a reminder of um, how, when I said we're trying to make conservative uh, decisions because we don't have the strongest information at this point to feel confident that this prior screen or forecast is 100% correct. So I wanted to put this out there as we we're talking about decision packages in the in the coming weeks. And I will talk much more in detail about the general fund when we get to the meeting on the 17th of June, and I'll be able to provide a little more information on the on this at the time. But I did want to put that out there because I feel like it's a very impactful view. So other funds that are impacted by COVID directly, as you or aware of airport fund. Um, what I'm showing you here is um, the revenue impact 
related to um, operating. And it looks like my, I'm missing a table on this screen, um, but we have um, the decrease. This is to the operating revenue and that um, there's also impacts to their non-operating revenue that the department and uh, the budget analysts will talk about a little bit more in detail when they get there. But I wanted to mention that the $8.7 million in CARES Act um, received by the airport can actually be used for offsetting revenue losses, unlike the general fund. So this is that actually can be used to offset uh, personnel costs and anything to keep the op uh, operations uh, going so that they plan to use that over the next couple of years to offset revenue losses. The tourist development tax is taking a big hit, um, as you're aware, and luckily uh, you'll be hearing from them this morning as well. But over 20 uh, FY 20 and 21, uh, there's expected to be about a 35 million dollar impact. Um, some of the things they're doing to try to offset that and mitigate some of the um, impact of that is uh, defunding vacant positions, um, reducing some of the contracts they have for advertising, and and actually reducing the transfer for uh, beach renourishment to the Capital Improvement Fund. And um, you'll hear a little bit more about that um, in in our couple of probably a couple of hours. The tourist, tr uh, excuse me, the transportation trust fund is another fund that you know you're all aware of um, was not in great shape before COVID-19. Um, there's it, at about a 3.2 million dollar decrease in revenue related to fuel tax from our original projections. Um, while it doesn't seem very severe, as uh, as a high dollar based on the uh, shape of that fund before COVID-19, it it is making quite an impact. And as you will see, we're underwater by the end of uh, FY22, whereas in our prior projections, we were actually, it was gonna be actually FY23 before we would be um, negative on that. So that's one of the areas that we're really looking closely at. Um, there's obviously um, some efforts to reduce that impact. One of the larger considerations uh, is each year, the Transportation Trust Fund um, transfers about $1.7 million to the Capital Improvement Fund for um, a ninth cent fuel tax revenue uh, for certain projects, the uh, ITS and ATMS projects. Uh, for FY21, we've halted that transfer for that year to offset some of the impacts. And uh, there's also a, a smaller operating reductions the, departments or the department is looking at to try to mitigate some of the um, the impact from COVID-19. And as I mentioned, the Capital Projects Fund, as you're aware, is highly reliant on sales tax. Um, in this case, they're pro we're projecting about a decrease of 10% um, in FY20 from our original projection uh, and 21, 8% original from the original projection. And this is in the sales tax only. Um, obviously, the, the Capital Projects Fund also receives grants and other forms of revenue, but directly related to sales tax, those are the projections that we're looking at. And also just reiterating what I mentioned previously, it's a reduction in transfers from other funds, the Tourist Development Tax Fund. Um, like I said, they're trying to offset some of their revenue reductions by transferring less of the beach renourishment funding over to CIP, and the Transportation Trust Fund will be halting uh, for FY21, that $1.7 million in ninth cent fuel tax. And I believe the CIP uh, discussion is, I believe, tomorrow. So there'll be more, much more detail on that. And so just to conclude, what I'm trying to do with a high level overview is um, obviously, like I said earlier, you'll hear a lot more detail about this as we're talking with the departments and their budget analysts, uh, specifically details on those impacts from COVID-19. We've tried to um, point those out in their analyses and make sure they're very clear that, you know, these are changes that we had not expected, that these are, this is what we're doing to try to mitigate those. And some funds that are impacted directly by the COVID-19 as well, as far as their revenue, and also some of their expenditures that I did not bring up yet, um, as far as the forecast documents. 
um, or the EMS fund, the Intergovernmental Radio Fund, um, Emergency 911 Fund, and the Building Services Fund. And we will talk more about that and you will see the updated forecast um, within those department presentations. So that was a lot of information, but um, are there any questions that I can answer at this time? And like I said, more detailed answers can obviously come from the departments. Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Commissioner Eggers, you're muted. I'm sorry, sir. Sorry about that. Um, it was, thank you for your presentation, Cynthia. I was looking at the slide eight, where it talks from 2020 to 2021, the expenditure curve is is pretty flat. So I just and then and then from 21 to 22, it actually goes up at an even higher rate than you you forecast out in later years. Um, and you probably touched on it, um, and I, my brain wasn't receiving it. If you did, so could you go over that again, just a little bit, as to why you see such a um, flat increase in our expenses? Um, I mean, that's, I think that's a good thing. I was just wondering what, where that's coming from and then uh, why the larger than normal increase from 21 to 22. Thank you. Okay. Um, sure. Um, let me pull this over so I can look at We We use typically an assumption of CPI for our operating. Um, at this point, we're projecting about 2.2 million um, I'm sorry, 2.2% increase in operating, but other things that do impact that um, and that actually have been impacting the general fund um, significantly without going into digging into um, all of the details. But uh, we do uh, inflate our, our constitutional officers budgets at a higher rate based on um, some of their costs associated with it. The personnel cost is um, a bit higher for the sheriff uh, based on the special risk and their retirement um, and their insurance. And we also have the TIF, the tax increment financing for the CRAs, and that has been increasing um, exponentially <laughs> over the past few years with our, uh, our property values. And even though we're projecting decreases, those, um, the, and those may come down as we're refining our numbers, but those have been also, also kind of growing at a higher rate. Um, for the new construction. Um, but a lot of that is the um, constitutional officers and um, how quickly those, th those budgets grow. Um, okay, maybe um, I'm still not picking up why we're showing such a small increase in the expense side. I, I'm, I just missed that. I, why do you show such, you're virtually keeping expenses flat from this year's budget to next year's budget? and then significant increase next year. I'm not talking about the revenue side, just the expense side. Let me pull up that chart. Um, from this year's budget, let me hang on. 2020 to 2021, mm -hmm. um, your red line is, is pretty flat. Right, so what we're, we're re basically just, um, we're not including any decision packages, which actually helps us stay flat on that. And then that increases the 2.2% um, that we're looking at for um, our operating increases. So uh, let me dig into the numbers on that. And you also have to, um, one of the things too, is we're basing um, our, what you'll see in our FY20 and our FY21, uh, we, you know, we have, uh, these are, the 20 is built on the estimate as well. So um, we do build in a lapse into our estimate um, just because we have experienced lapse year over year. Um, like I said, 20, 23 million plus last year. So we built in a, um, about a 3% lapse into the FY20 estimate. Um, but expenditure wise, That's actually, it, it doesn't look like much on the chart, but that is according to my pro forma. Yeah, it's about a 2% increase, which is in alignment and, with our, our operating. And then, 20, and then 21 20 to 22, it's a, it's, it's a considerably higher rate of increase in the expenses. So 
Um, okay. I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit more yeah. and be able to, um, I'll try okay. to make sure there's no strange, nothing strange happening with our assumptions there. And we, when we have the general fund discussion or even prior to that, I'll give you a little more detail about that or make sure there's not anything that's kind of wacky in our formulas there, but um, I'll get you more information about that. Okay, thank you. And then the last question I had is, what is your built-in assumption on, on, on the proposed request for wage increase in 20, the 2021 budget from this year? At this point, we've factored in a 3%. Um, and that's something that we, we tend to do every year when we're building the budget. And that also gives us the flexibility of being able to adjust that um, down if we need to. So right now, what you're looking at does build in that 3%. So that is something that we are um, prepared to start as we're looking for funding options, um, if we if we need to do that, we will be playing with those numbers a little bit. But we start with that in there, and then work down from there if we need to. And that and that 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 uh, salaries represent about sixty percent of the overall cost. Is that about right? Yeah, some, uh, that's about right. Okay, thank you. And and Cecilia, I can jump in just for a second to help explain the uh, twenty versus twenty one, and it looking a little bit more flat. Um, because we're estimating 20 to include about $8 million in COVID costs, that's going to reflect a little bit higher of a number than we're going to see in 21 where we don't reflect $8 million in COVID costs. So that's going to be part of the reason for the flattening. And as Barry had pointed out, and Cecilia as well, a lot of the departments have done a really good job in coming in at less than what the inflation factor would otherwise suggest for the FY21 request. So when you put those two factors together, you're seeing a flatter trend line, specifically okay. from this year's estimate to next year's budget request. And then you return to the trend line that you have for the assumptions starting in 22. So that's a large reason that you're seeing that change where it looks like the trend line has changed because the 21 is not actually based on the trend line. That's based on a specific request that's also influenced by a non-recurring activity in 20. Okay. That helps. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. Thanks for catching that. <laughs> While I'm not suggesting this, I'm just asking the question. The $170 million that we've received, that we're using part of it for the um, CARES funding, um, it was noted in, uh, previously that we have $8 million in COVID expenses. Can that be covered by the $170 million? It could be. Um, so the, the direct expenses we have from COVID could be covered under that. That'll be one of the considerations. Um, one of the considerations also, though, is to, if dependent upon the program outline, we'll get to this when we bring back recommendations, is just submit that to FEMA and get then 75% on the money, bringing up the, 100, the, the CARES Act money for other purposes. So that'll be a choice when we, when we set the uh, program criteria for phase two. Okay, and my second question is, it was mentioned that um, we received 11.9 million in Hurricane Irma from FEMA. Are, have we now received, or will we receive, or when will we receive everything that we were still due from the federal government as well as the state? Are, we haven't talked about that for quite a while. You're right, I'll, I'll, I'll let Bill or Cecilia answer that. We're on a positive path as far as getting those funds back, um, but as far as predicting when we get the entire amount back, um, I wouldn't pretend to be able to predict that. Um, we're cautiously optimistic that by the end of this year, maybe into next year, 20, you know, FY21, we'll have all that reimbursement in hand. Um, we've actually had a significant acceleration in how much we've gotten back relative to what we expected going into this budget year. Um, so that's the reason for the optimism there. So don't have to do it now, but if we could get a, you know, how much we've asked for versus what we've now received, that would be very informational. Thank you. We'd be happy to share that. And we'll share that uh, later today. We've got, or after today's meeting, uh, we have a spreadsheet that we keep that documents uh, fully exactly what's out there still remaining of what we've received. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, Commissioner Walsh. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just have to say, Bill, that's how I always imagine the OMB background. You look like the voice of God <laughs> speaking. Uh, but um, 
So Cecilia, on your um, chart number eight, you had mentioned 6% decrease in revenues in FY22, and then you gave us some other increase numbers for following years. Can you repeat that? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, for FY23, I, uh, we have a 1% increase, uh, 24, 2%, and then we factored in a 3% increase for 25 and 26. Okay. And you also mentioned some uh, factors that helped us this year. You mentioned the, the FEMA reimbursement, and then you mentioned something like carryover. Yes. Um, can so, you explain that a little bit further? Sure, absolutely. So when we prepare our budget, and you're, you're hearing me talk about the 20 estimate, each department, um, as they're providing their budget request, they're asked to estimate how much they think they'll spend for the current year. Um, Unfortunately, we prepare the budget quite early in the year, so we're, we're usually not spot on with those. So what we build our budget with as far as our beginning fund balance for FY20 uh, for this year was based on those FY19 estimates. So that told us how much money we thought we were going to have left in the general fund from prior year to be able to um, expend in FY20. It turned out that a lot of... Uh, the things that we were expecting to spend money on or departments were expecting to complete or um, a lot of times it comes from vacancies that we don't project to have but we ended up carrying over an additional 23 million from what we had projected in development of the budget um, and that's those, another reason are we those dollar are those dollars that will be expended or are these actual free dollars that won't be expended a few of those have already been appropriated. So um, I think maybe back in January, February, you would have seen a, a resolution come to the board carrying over some um, operating dollars, but it was, it was very minimal of that, maybe a million, million and a half. Um, so everything is factored into our 21 budget uh, request. So not much of that was actually reprogrammed. Okay. So it is available for spending. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And I, but I would also add, just as a reminder, those are non-recurring dollars. Um, so that's a one-time increase that we see, and we want to make sure that any expenditure that we use those for is aligned with the non-recurring expenditure. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Okay. Is that it, Cecilia? For that, okay. That's all I have. All right. Well, then we can move in. Unless there's other questions, uh, we can move into the first budget presentation, and that's back to our property appraiser. Good morning, everybody. My name is Don Mello. I'm with the Office of Management and Budget, and I am the budget analyst for the property appraiser. At this time, I'd like to share my screen and review a few key points with our budget. Sure that. Can everybody see that document? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to scroll down and talk about the increase. Uh, property appraiser's total request this year of operating is $14.4 million. It's an increase of 351 thousand or two and a half percent from FY20. Um, of that amount, the general fund fee transfers are expected to increase 289,000. This is the information that's shown in the table, um, the general fund portion. The uh, property appraiser's request did come in below target and their Budget supports 131, or I'm sorry, 130 positions that remain unchanged from last year. Some of the key points to remember or to consider is that the property appraiser's budget is submitted and approved by the State uh, Department of Revenue. Um, actually, that was submitted earlier this week, I believe. Um, they are fully funded, the property appraiser is fully funded from the commissions that are paid by the taxing authorities. Um, the commission calculation is set by Florida statute, and any commissions that are not expended by the property appraiser are returned to each one of the taxing authorities in proportionate share. Those are the major areas 
Um, if there's any questions, I can take those at this time. So we'll, the way, if we can, Madam Chair, is um, just uh, the budget analyst to go through it if you have any questions for them. Um, if not, then we'll turn it over to, in this case, the Constitutional Officer, Mike Twitty, and um, then he can go through his and just explain the things that are impacting his budget and you know what's going on. Okay, great. And if you have a, yes, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, just, just so I'm, I'm clear, this, this number here is just the general fund part of his overall budget. The overall budget is what uh, you said was 14? Correct, $14.4 million. 14.4, okay. Thank you. And if you have any questions when the screen sharing is up, just start talking, because <laughs> I can't see you. I don't know where to do it. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, this is Mike. I'll jump in. Um, so as you can see, we're, we're holding operating expenses flat over over last year. The only rise is, is within the, the personnel services area, which obviously includes all, all staff and, and health benefits. Um, so while we do have a lot of projects going on, within the office, we're able to, to handle most of those internally or um, work with work with some some outside vendors um, to accomplish those. And we're, we're, we're staying in, in check with where we were last year. Mike? Yes. All right, so the number of folks that you have working in your proposed budget is the same as this year. Do you have any unfunded or any positions that haven't been filled or are they all filled? They're not all filled. We're at, I think as of today, we're at 126. Right. And, and, and we're, we're getting ready to make up. Yeah, we're getting ready to make a hire probably next week. And we need to hire another commercial appraiser. So we'll, we'll end up being probably around 128, 129 coming up here. But you were funded for 129 in this year's budget. Uh, 130. 130. 130. Okay. Yes. Right. Gotcha. Thank you, Mike. But you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions for Mike? Okay. I, can I can I go back to Commissioner Welch's question? I know we're we're jumping topics a little bit, but I wanted to on that ja that January one um, and about relief for our citizens. Um, you know, the, the value piece of the equation on arriving at, at tax bills because, you know, it's value times military equals taxes. Mm -hmm. um, the, the January 1 date, that, that's set by, by statute that, that prevents us from, from deviating from that. So, so really any relief has to come from, from a mil military perspective, but that becomes challenging in this year as we just, we just heard because of um, the revenue loss in other areas. So, so those things make these things difficult, but something could come out of the state legislature um, next year that could grant some some relief in some form, but it probably would be some sort of a credit in the following year. It still would yeah. probably be out of cycle. Yeah, and that's the kind of, uh, that's what I was aiming at. I know I didn't um, state that eloquently. Um, do you know if any of the CARES Act funding or the, um, the PPP funding can be applied towards paying that tax bill for a commercial? I would imagine. I mean, that's part of overhead. Okay. I didn't know if it was restricted to salaries or if they could use it for taxes. Because I thought but, um, they could pay rent and expenses and property taxes are an expense. So I would, I would assume. Okay. I, I think the, the challenge we may have with uh, aligning CARES Act funding with uh, paying a property tax bill is that it has to be something that is a COVID related impact since March 1st. Um, right. So if there's an ability to align that expenditure with a COVID related impact, then I think that's something that would be allowable. Um, however, um, because of the fact that the valuation is based on pre COVID, it's right. going to be hard in my estimation to make that alignment. Uh, the other thing about CARES Act to remember is the funds have to be expended by December 30th. Okay. So there's a timing issue that may 
be uh, problematic with that concept as well. Hey, Bill, could they maybe do some for to qualify for CARES? Could they do some sort of a, a proration? So if COVID was impacting them for X amount of months, could they maybe prorate that amount for the towards the tax bill? I couldn't answer that at this point. Um, okay. We probably need some additional guidance from Treasury, which has um, been hit and miss. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, let's move on. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, thank you, sir. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Let me know if I can help. Okay, next up is the airport. Good morning. My name is Erica Mitchell, and I'm the operating and budget analyst for the airport. I would like to introduce Shane Kunsa as the strategic performance analyst, and he will be reviewing some of the performance measures to get us started. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Good morning, commissioners, and uh, thank you. Um, it appears my video has been stopped by the host, so Brian, if you could uh, free me up there, I'd appreciate it. Sorry about that, sir. Give me one. No more. worries. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is uh, Shane Kunza, and I am the SPM Analyst for Airport. I'm going to talk to you today about how uh, they're doing on their performance measures and also how COVID-19 has impacted those as well. Um, airports across the U.S. undergo FAA certification inspections, and uh, PI has not failed an inspection or received a fine this fiscal year. I'm also pleased to report that PI has surpassed their target of 85% for air carriers in compliance of noise abatement procedures. COVID-19 is not expected to have an impact on the performance measures I just mentioned. However, COVID-19 had a major impact on the department overall. Air travel across the world began to grind to a halt as the virus spread and Pi was no exception. The total passenger count began to shrink in March and took a deeper decline in April. Concessionaire revenue decreased as foot traffic through Pi lessened and non-aeronautical revenue also declined as tenants sought relief from lease payments. Some performance measures are already beginning to show some improvement in the month of May. COVID-19 will also delay their work plan initiative that involves rebid of the airport advertising concession. And we are expecting to see movement on this later in the fall. Uh, thank you, that's all I have um, at this time. If you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise we can move on to uh, Erica and the budget section. Okay. So continuing on to efficiencies, the airport started using new RAXAR technology to improve and automate the maintenance and work order process by eliminating the need for handwritten or physical markers for issues that need to be repaired. Another efficiency the airport realized was with the addition of the part-time administrative assistant this has allowed the badging office to stay open additional hours. So contractors, concessionaires, and staff who are unable to make it in during normal operating hours are able to still get badges. The airport has four decision packages. They total about $183,000. They include a pavement crack sealing machine, a ground master mower 400, a redundant security access control server, and a plan to substitute all of the dumpsters with a trash compactor. Potential threats. The threats of COVID-19 will have a negative impact on the airport. The airport has worked to mitigate these impacts by cutting expenditures, adjusting their capital program, and receiving CARES Act funding. Another issue that the airport has faced is difficulty retaining and recruiting uh, crafts workers. So even with the addition of two FTEs and FY20, overtime and contracted services did not decrease as anticipated due to turnovers and vacancies. Moving on to the budget summary. The next few bullet points reference the revenues included in the current budget request as compared to the FY20 adopted budget. 
Operating revenue has decreased by $2 million from FY20. That is the FY20 estimate. This includes $3 million of CARES funded being programmed in FY20. FY21 will see an increase of $2.4 million due to the new concession concession heirs agreement being fully implemented and the remaining $5.7 million in CARES funding being programmed into the budget. FY20 non-operating revenue estimate increased by approximately $1.9 million as compared to the FY20 adopted budget. This is due to the timing of CIP projects that were already in progress and the anticipated grant drawdowns. Non-operating revenue for FY21 will decrease by $7.2 million, and this is due to the deferment of several CIP projects. The next few bullet points detail the revenue impacts related to COVID as compared to the original budget submission in March. So as stated earlier, the airport received $8.7 million in CARES funding. We programmed $3 million in FY20 and $5.7 million in FY21. The overall impacts of the operating revenue for FY20 and FY21 are estimated to be about $10.5 million as compared to the original budget submission. The FY21 non-operating revenues were reduced an additional $5.2 million as compared to the budget submission back in March. Again, this is mainly due to shifting out four CIP projects out into the out years that have yet to start. Moving on to the expenditures. The bullets below detail the reduction in expenditures as compared to the FY20 budget. The airport reduced their FY20 estimated expenditures by $5 million. This reduction includes the decision to hold five positions vacant through the third quarter of FY21, a reduction in operating expenditures including postponing small projects, a reduction in the custom and border personnel services, and also a reduction in promotional activities. Capital outlay and CIP projects decreased by $3.5 million as compared to the FY20 budget. The FY21 budget request decreased by $9.7 million from the FY20 adopted budget. This is mostly due to capital improvement projects being shifted out and also a reduction in capital outlay. The next few bullets will detail the impact of COVID on expenditures as it relates to the original budget submission. The FY20 estimate for airport expenditures actually increased by $1.8 million from, original, from the original estimates, mainly due to the timing of three CIP projects, mostly the, the land side. The FY21 budget request has decreased by $5.5 million since it was first submitted by, holding, by the department. Again, these reductions are by holding those positions vacant until the third quarter of FY21 and a delay in their CIP. The airport's six-year CIP decreases by $55.5 million from the adopted to the proposed. This is mainly due to shifting out the terminal improvements and also the completion of several large CIP projects, including the customs, customs and border protection improvements, security system upgrades, terminal improvements, ticketing A inline baggage project, and the new maintenance facility. The proposed CIP plan includes three new project requests that include airco improvements to drainage and access roads, and also to pave the strawberry lot and shuttle road. The airport is proposing some changes to their user fees as well. The above user fees have not been changed or reviewed since 2015. These changes will bring the airport user fees more in line with, with current airports, with other airports. These fees will result in an increase of about $8,600 in additional revenue per year. There was a delay in implementing the new transportation network fees that were approved in FY20. 
This was due to some delays with getting the software up and running and putting contracts in place. So a full year's revenue will not be realized um, in FY20, but the contracts are making their way through Granicus now, and we hope that we'll start seeing revenues by the end of the summer. The airport will continue to monitor and make adjustments as necessarily due to the COVID impacts. This is their FY21 budget based on the information we have right now. Is there any question? Yeah, I have a question. This is uh, Dave Eggers. Okay. Uh, under <clears throat> on slide three, under rent surplus and refunds for the 20 estimate, you've shown about a 33% reduction in rent there. And um, I'm assuming it's because some of our folks are behind in rent or we're spreading it out or you know vacancies or whatever. Could you speak to that just a little bit, please? Um, I believe they were issuing deferments uh, for some of their tenants that will be repaid within the next few months. Is that correct, Tom? Yeah, good morning, Commissioner. Um, yes, uh, initially we had 15 requests for rent relief. Uh, we went ahead and ha actually had an application that they would submit. We've only had 10 of those. Uh, we've agreed to provide three months of rent relief uh, and that uh, relief needs to be paid by the end of this calendar year. Oh, so some of that money uh, would then gets bumped into uh, to 21? That is correct. Yeah. But the number for 21 is still lower than the budget for 20. So is there, is there, you're anticipating some folks, some vacancies? Is that, is that your? Um, some of that would be as far as uh, rental. We have a legion right now. They have uh, two buildings that they lease from us. They uh, just completed uh, a new operations and maintenance facility. So they will be vacating uh, the office space that they lease from us. Though, so that will uh, result in a reduction of rent that we currently receive. All right. Well, I just, first of all, I just wanted to commend you for, for making the obviously necessary adjustments, not only on, on the budget, but on the number of folks, positions you're leaving open, um, and just obviously adjusting to the market and adjusting to the operations and income that you've got coming into the airport. And, um, I know that that's going to be probably a repeating theme, but I know it, it's, it's affected you all pretty dramatically. So yeah, I appreciate, appreciate the work so far in, in getting those budgets. No, down. I appreciate that. And it, it was difficult, but yeah, we had to freeze uh, quite a few positions. We were able to uh, realize about over $300,000 of immediate savings for the next six months. And as you heard, shifting about $11 million in capital projects. Um, I will say just, just briefly, um, we are above the norm in, when, in the way of seeing, seeing an uptick in passenger traffic. Uh, nationally, it's still down about 80, 85%. Just over the past couple of days, we've seen uh, traffic uh, starting to uh, rebound to approximately 60% of where we were a year ago. So hopefully that's a continued trend. We're seeing the traveler, the leisure traveler uh, bounce back a lot quicker to the market. Uh, Legion, of course, nonstop flights, direct service, so people you know, people are trying to avoid connections because of the difficulty and the scale down of uh, connections. So I think a lot of that's contributing to it. Plus uh, the beaches are open, unlike Vegas where casinos are still shut, um, Orlando Sanford area where the attractions are still closed and starting to open up. A lot of the focus of travel has been to the leisure market. So again, hopefully that can, uh, tr trend continues and uh, certainly encouraging at this time. Yeah, that was going to be my question. If you see more of the incoming um, traffic increasing or both, I mean, out, outgoing and in, you know, I'm just, I'm thinking of people coming here versus, you know, folks, you know, starting to travel. travel yeah, out. what we've been tracking right now is basically uh, outbounds, uh, inflaments. Uh, we're waiting for uh, the, the DDP inflaments or inbound uh, numbers to come in this okay. week. So we will have the full uh, impact of uh, May. Overall, May is still going to be down uh, 60%. But again, if you focus on just basically the past 10 to 14 days, that's where we're really seeing that um, uptick, and it's it's the trends continuing. Good, good, good for the uh, good for the uh, I guess the tourism industry. Uh, Nerve-wracking as far as our beaches go. So uh, we <laughs> keep 
keep keep on alert. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. Tom Ken, Ken Welch, I know the chair can't see everybody. Um, thanks for the presentation. Talk a little bit about with this uptick in um, passengers now, what, do, what are you doing in terms of sanitizing and making sure it's a safe environment, not only for the passengers, but for your employees as well? Sure, um, early on, um, even before March, we really uh, uh, made a valid effort to go ahead and in increase uh, sanitation. Uh, sanitizing uh, the type of equipment we use. It's called electrostaticing. It's what the hospitals use. So uh, it maintains a clean surface for a period of time, almost up to 30 days. Of course, uh, increased uh, hand sanitization. Uh, we have a whole action plan as far as a recovery where our employees, when they're in public areas, are using the mask. Uh, we encourage, strongly encourage all the tenants to do the same. Uh, we have audible announcements that go over the PA system, uh, advising passengers of uh, certain precautions, uh, using social media to get out that uh, word as well. A lot of the obvious stuff that you've seen elsewhere in, in supermarkets and all as far as the social distancing practices with markings on the floor, uh, uh, reducing um, uh, seating capacity. So we've been able to uh, promote that and trying to maintain that social distancing and that cleaning. But one of the biggest challenges is going to be not only just with us, but all airports nationwide, as we start to see that travel resume, how do we continue to try to maintain that social distancing um, with, mm -hmm. the, with the infrastructure that we have? So uh, that's something that we're uh, continuing to monitor. Again, we had uh, built a recovery action plan that we've uh, shared and with our tenants and have put that out publicly. Yeah, because your spaces weren't designed for that six foot buffer so you've had to go and make some physical re rearrangements yeah and again it's uh like i said it's traffic rebuild it's going to be it's going to be a little more difficult and we're working with other airports and and trade associations to really try to understand what that means and and, and how we make that work going forward okay my last question madam chair going following up commissioner eggers on the rents line item there was a big drop between FY 17 and 18. Do you remember what that was? It went from 25 yeah. million to roughly 13 and a half. In FY 17, we sold land to FDOT oh, that's for it. about $12.5 million. So that was a bump up anomaly right. for that year. Okay. Right. And that was directly associated with um, selling of land for the Gateway Express project. Okay. All right. Thanks, Thank, thank you. Any other questions for the airport? I guess not. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Celia, anything um, next? Go Keep going. Or not, I'll just do it then. Uh, convention of visitors. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Barry. Um, I'm going to share my documents. Um, okay. Is that is that shared? Not yet. Uh, we're not seeing anything, Jim. Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Jim Abernathy. I'm with uh, OMB, and I am the budget analyst for Convention and Visitors Bureau. And uh, the SPM analyst again will be Shane. Uh, so um, you'll get to hear him again uh, speak about the performance measures for uh, for the CVB. Uh, Shane, if you want to kick it off and give an overview. Shane? Sorry, I forgot I was muted. <laughs> Thank you, guys. 
CVB is currently reviewing performance measures with staff and SPM in an effort to retire measures that may no longer be needed and to develop additional key performance indicators that help us better tell efficiency and effectiveness to the overall department. I cannot speak to CVB performance measures that are not impacted by COVID-19 as every aspect of Pinellas County's tourism economy is being impacted by the pandemic. As businesses and air travel were restricted, beaches closed and conferences canceled, the number of visitors coming to Pinellas County drastically decreased. This has resulted in a reduction of hotel occupancy, average daily rates for hotel rooms and length of stay for our guests. As hotel occupancy and average daily rates decrease, so too does the tourist development tax revenue that CBB relies on. This also has the potential to impact the over 90,000 employees that rely on the Pinellas County tourism economy for income. We know that tourist development tax revenue saw a reduction of 48.1% for the month of March 2020. Additional data on COVID-19's impact for the months of April and May will be available in the near future, but we can expect further declines. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shane. Um, they, uh, as, uh, as Cecilia mentioned earlier, uh, the CVB or the, the TDT fund is uh, saw an immediate and drastic uh, impact from the COVID-19 uh, shutdowns uh, that occurred within the county and uh, around the around the world. Really, uh, the uh, so we'll get to the their numbers uh, in a few minutes. But the uh, CVB did submit one. Uh, decision package, uh, which was requested uh, a couple months ago at the TDC meeting for a sponsorship opportunity for Super Bowl uh, 55, which is uh, scheduled at this point to be played in Tampa on the 7th of February of 2021. Uh, they've asked for $1.5 million as a sponsorship level. Uh, and uh, Steve Hayes, the director of uh, CVB, uh, could give more details on that if, uh, if you would like. Um, but as a comparison, uh, we have done this with other events in the past. Uh, most recently on the Super Bowl, we did it with uh, Super Bowl 43 in, um, in 2009, and that was a $750,000 uh, sponsorship agreement. And then uh, just a few years ago uh, with the uh, college football playoff national championship game in 2017. It was a $650,000 uh, sponsorship um, agreement that we, uh, that we entered. Uh, we also had an agreement with the RNC, uh, the Republican National Convention back in 2016. And I believe that amount was $600,000. Um, all of these events took place in Tampa, but because of our location, location and uh, proximity to Tampa, uh, there were side events that took place in the uh, in the county, and obviously hotel rooms were used by attendees of all of these events. Uh, the difference uh, between this particular request, uh, other than the the size of the request, is that with those other events, we were part of a group that went out and bid on each of these each of those events. Uh, before they were awarded. Uh, with this request, uh, the Super Bowl is going to be played here. Um, the, it was a, an emergency deal because the stadium in Los Angeles was not going to be ready in time. Uh, so they moved that Super Bowl and we, were, uh, we showed that we were able to host this event as we've done in the past. So the Super Bowl was awarded to us and there wasn't uh, as much of a bid process as uh, as has happened in the past. Uh, potential threats, obviously, the uh, continued impact from COVID-19. Excuse me. Uh, and then uh, that we saw um, an immediate impact on the uh, hotel stays and uh, the the tourist development tax revenue that each of those produces uh, beginning in our busiest month uh, of March with uh, spring break. Uh, if, if it had gone without COVID-19, we uh, probably would have collected uh, in excess of $10 million 
in the month of March for the TDT. Um, but we actually only uh, collected, uh, we collected under $5 million. It was a uh, almost 49% decrease from March of 2019. So we saw that uh, immediate impact from the, uh, from the COVID shutdown. Um, the redu there's also potential threats for a reduced amount of federal or state funding available for our beach renourishment projects. Um, each year we have budgeted the equivalent of uh, half of one of the TDT percents, uh, the dollar value of that. And uh, we transfer that to the capital fund for their use uh, through um, uh, to use as matching for uh, various grants. If either the state or the federal government uh, reduces their grants available, uh, that would put a bigger strain on our capital uh, project or reduce potentially uh, beach nourishment projects that we could complete. Um, there's also the possibility of further cuts to visit Florida, uh, who is a partner of ours uh, when, we, uh, when we market the destination. Uh, and then another uh, potential uh, threat is um, expanding the use of the tourist development tax revenue uh, outside of what is currently allowable uh, by state law. Uh, this would just put additional pressure on, uh, on the fund if there are other requests coming in that, that currently aren't, are not allowed. On the revenue side, uh, as you can see um, from FY17 through FY19, we had um, steady, uh, pretty spectacular growth uh, in the tourist development tax uh, revenue. We budgeted uh, just over $61 million uh, for the FY20 budget, and we were going along uh, smoothly to exceed that. Uh, we were, uh, prior to COVID-19, we, we were building a budget with an estimate of $64.6 .6 million in revenue for FY20. Um, but shortly after the budget was submitted, uh, the statewide shutdown um, pretty much started happening. And we immediately went to, uh, to change those estimates. So currently we're estimating $37.5 million in TDT revenue, um, which as you can see is a, uh, a drastic drop for one for one year. Uh, FY21, we're seeing a uh, we're projecting a, a slow, uh, but not quite back to normal uh, rate of increase um, uh, over the the current year. Um, what we're projecting is through the uh, in October, November, and December that we're going to have a 50% decrease from the previous. October, November, December timeframe as the, uh, hopefully the COVID crisis um, is winding down and there isn't a major flare up and people will, um, will return to some of their travel. Um, the, the rest of the fiscal year, we're, uh, we're using a 85%, 85% uh, of the last year prior to COVID happening. So um, it would be uh, March of 2019 uh, for our base year because March of 2020, uh, that's when we started seeing the impact of, of COVID. Um, so the, the decrease is $9.7 million um, in FY20 or FY21. And then um, the, um, which is uh, better than we had in originally anticipated, but it's still lower than uh, project or where the trend trend would normally take us. On the expenditure side, this is uh, where they had to uh, really look at their at the budget, what makes up their budget in order to um, to live within the new revenue structure that we were seeing. Uh, we, they had a, an estimate of, or they had a budget of $85.3 million. And we are, um, after, the, after they re-looked at their budget, uh, we got it 
they're they're down to just uh, over uh, just under seventy million dollars in estimates. Uh, the biggest chunk of that is in the grants and aids, and that is uh, that includes the city of Dunedin spring training project, which uh, we anticipate will be finished uh, payment uh, in this fiscal year. There might be some rollover to next year, but that would just reduce the um, the expenditure for this year. So there it would not have a impact on the on the FY21 budget. We would have to adjust it to account for that, but uh, it, we would still have those resources available. Um, as you can see in the transfer to capital fund, since we're projecting a drastic decrease in the revenue, we also decrease the uh, the transfer to co to uh, to match it with the half of one of the TDT percents for um, uh, to keep those values equal. Uh, they were able to uh, defund or keep open uh, six of their currently vacant positions uh, in uh, for the rest of FY20. And then uh, for FY21, they, uh, they're keeping four of those, four of their vacant positions. Uh, they're not funding those in FY21. So they will uh, keep those positions open. And uh, uh, they also were able to uh, decrease a lot of uh, expenditures within the operating budget uh, for advertising uh, uh, contract. They reduced it by 700, uh, just over $700,000 uh, travel. They, uh, they also um, they did a lot of reductions for those. Uh, the beach transfer is uh, about just under a million dollars lower than uh, the current budget level. Um, however, with uh, with the way their budget is made up, uh, they were not able to just make cuts throughout the uh, various programs to to get within their budget. Um, within their operating budget, they have they have two big contracts that really is the heart of their um, of what they do and it's the marketing advertising budget and between the uh, the traditional advertising and the digital uh, it's about 20 million dollars of their operating budget uh, their operating budget is at 32.8 million dollars um, so uh, because of the, the importance of that uh, they felt that they needed to keep that at that level. In order to find the funding for that, uh, there was there was a suggestion or the, a request to suspend the uh, capital funding program in the for the CVB uh, for FY20 uh, FY21 and use the dollars that would be norm that would normally be part of the 40% split between operating and capital and use those to. Um, to promote the, the destination. Uh, Mr. Um, Steve's going to get into that when he gets to his presentation, but we're talking about a one year. Um, he has talked to TDC members and, um, and again, he'll, he'll brief this as part of that. It would, it would still keep all of the current commitments um, for past projects that we've, we have contracts with, um, but for new projects going forward is the way they would retain that. So. Correct, we, and uh, we currently uh, have just a, a few projects that uh, that we're finishing up in uh, FY20 and FY21, and it would not impact those uh, at this time. And it would just be a temporary suspension of uh, of the use of the forty percent. Um, On the uh, on the next page, these are the current projects that we have out there: uh, the Blue Jays training at thirty-three million dollars, the Dolly at five hundred thousand, and the American Craftsman Museum at two million dollars. And all of those um, are ending in FY twenty. As I said, the some of the expenditures for the Blue Jays may roll over to next year, depending on timing of when they complete the project. Those funds are uh, are available in either FY20 or FY21. The the total amount that we're committed to pay them is not changing. So those funds will either be paid out in completion in 20 or some roll over to 21. Uh, the FY21 budget includes uh, 950,000 for the countryside sports complex, 
350 for the Florida Holocaust Museum and the the last of the payments for uh, the Philly Spring Training Complex in, in Clearwater at uh, just under $250,000. So these are current commitments that we would be paying out. So these are still included within the budget, Jim? Yes. Yeah. They, these are part of the budget that was, that is being considered uh, in their request. Uh, okay. So there aren't, aren't any uh, additional um, projects that, that uh, we need to add in there. Uh, as I said, the, the transfer to the capital fund, uh, we're still planning, we're still doing that. Uh, it's just at a lower rate, which would is match matching the uh, half of one of the TDT percents. Uh, any questions on those numbers or any of the particular projects? Uh, I know Steve would like uh, is available to explain what they're doing or how they're going to do it. Yeah, maybe maybe do that, Madam Chair. Just have Steve can kind of give his overview because I mean, that's a big area and there's <laughs> and a big impact. Yeah. Maybe have him summarize that and then we can open it up for all the questions. Great. Steve, you're on. Great, thank you, uh, commissioners um, and Jim for running through the, the presentation. Um, this, and again, uh, in terms of where to start with some of the, uh, from a presentation standpoint, I kind of wanted to go back real quickly on the conversation that you had with the, uh, regarding the airport and really looking at folks, you know, coming in, uh, the return, the return to travel to uh, St. Pete Clearwater. Um, I also wanna just really, uh, and Jim talked about this briefly, about where we, where we are coming from. Um, and again, when we look at, at where we were the first five months of this year, um, you know, the industry was rocking and rolling. Uh, we, were, we were way up. Uh, and then, you know, you see this, this drop, this drastic drop, uh, starting in the, the early part of March, all the way down. In fact, on uh, May, or I'm sorry, March, uh, March 30th, uh, the average occupancy uh, for hotels uh, in Pinellas County was 16.8%. And that was compared to the 72% if you looked at the same time period last year. As we move forward, you start, you know, we start to see that, uh, we start to see the uh, uh, increase and it's a very small increase. And where we start to see that is when the beaches reopened um, and that Mother's Day weekend and then up through Memorial Day. And if you look at that weekend, uh, we finished at 80.3% occupancy compared to 96 the year before. And while it's still down, that's a dramatic increase uh, of, of where we see it, uh, where we saw it previously. So we're starting to go through and see some of those things come back. I do want to share uh, a couple of slides with you as well, um, because I think the question came, came up about treat people traveling again. And um, so let me go through and see if I can do this right. Um, okay. All right, I, it's, I don't think it's working. Oh, no, nope, there we go. All right, I, I will skip that. But one, one of the things that we looked at uh, is uh, a survey that we did out for travelers. And if you look at the, the question was the likelihood to take a trip to uh, St. Pete Clearwater post pandemic, uh, Florida residents over half um, have indicated that they are very likely or somewhat likely to visit. And then out of state travelers, almost 50%, which was, which was a, a good news piece for us because we didn't expect that. We had really heard more local, regional as far as traveling, uh, but to see that show up, I think was en encouraging. And then combine that with the news that I think you heard through uh, uh, St. Pete Clearwater Airport, 
um, about what Allegiant and again, uh, folks uh, wanting to travel, I think bodes well as we are headed here into the summer months. One of the other questions we ask is the month that they would travel. Because again, we're trying to figure out, again, what we had heard was it was fall before we would start seeing anything. And the reality of it is that 43% of Florida residents and 32% of out-of-state travelers would actually come and visit between the months of June through August. Um, and if you look at the fall, um, again, in the uh, mid, uh, mid to low 30s for both audiences, and then we see a bigger rebound as we get to 2021. So I think that bodes well with uh, what um, Jim had said in terms of you know, the forecast on the, the TDT revenues. Um, the other thing when we brought up, when we talked about expense reductions, um, I just wanna kind of get into it in a, a couple of things. One is on the um, advertising side, um, we paused our marketing for roughly about 45 days. And we did that um, because at that point, there, a, the beaches were not open. And then even as they reopened, um, there was still some sensitivity to folks and making sure that as a destination that we were set up to welcome them um, in, in our community. We have since restarted that, and, um, but we're doing that in a, um, like in this case right now, doing a lot of uh, paid search as well as paid social. Um, coming up later, probably in the next th uh, two to three weeks, then we will start um, advertising um, with uh, in-state, um, but also that includes broadcast and print, and then also national radio, then out of state, and really a, a, structured, uh, a structured manner. We also uh, realize savings this year, but also for uh, next year, because certain programs that we normally have done aren't happening um, or did not happen. Um, and you know, and a, and a perfect example is uh, you know, Commissioner Gerard was supposed to join us in Germany the first week of March, and the show got canceled. And that happened basically starting in March and it's happening all the way through until even into September, October um, as conferences and trade shows learn about the, the new normal when it comes to, to the, those items. What's changed is they're going through and they will do things virtually. Um, and so we can still participate. Um, so we are able to say, okay, that's money we were able to save or not have to spend uh, this year. And then as we go through uh, for next year, um, again, based on the new normal, um, we may be going through and having uh, different staff attend different things, um, but not in the, uh, the capacity that we have, uh, that we have uh, uh, previously. Um, there was also uh, cancellations of elite events that we had funded through the event, elite event elite event program um, because the events didn't happen. Um, and so we were able to save dollars in, in that capacity. Um, and then there's also, uh, as we look forward to fiscal year 21, um, as Jim indicated, there are positions that have been vacant here um, for at least a year, at least since I've come on board, that we have said we are not going to fill for this year or for, uh, or, or for next year. In addition to that is really evaluated whether we need to be traveling for uh, training and education. Um, and so have reduced um, and cut out non-essential travel for those, those two items. Um, in addition, we are going through and looking at any of our outside contracts agreements uh, to make sure that what we're doing um, is going to have, and really I look at it from three ways, a high impact on our community in terms of whether it be visitor spending, TDT generation, room nights, uh, has a high return on investment um, to the community, but also high participation by our stakeholders. What, so as an example, uh, to go and do something with Allegiant Airlines would make more sense because we have a number of stakeholders that want to do that. And we also know that that's going to drive business back to, to our community. So again, you know, 
going back on our advertising and some of our, our sales programs is looking at things that have that item or those three items. Uh, the other element to that is also going through and um, on our advertising and, you know, let's go through. And even though we've had some great programs in the past, we almost kind of get to a, a back to the basics, things that are going to have a, a really good ROI for us. So we're able to reduce some things that we've done in the past. And then as funds increase, then we can choose to go through and re-engage those or put those dollars in other areas that have that, that um, high ROI. The other item that was mentioned uh, came back to um, uh, the, the capital program. And again, I want to go and re reiterate the, the discussion item on there was, um, you know, is there the opportunity? And, and while we have not had a TDC meeting to vet this completely, um, I've had a conversation with a few of the TDC members um, um, to just kind of get their opinion of this. Um, and I and I do think uh, when we are finally able to have a meeting, which I'm hoping will be at, you know later this month, um, that we can fully go through this. But again, how do we take the dollars that would have been set aside within the capital program and temporarily use it to boost up specific advertising and specific marketing that we're going to be doing to help uh, drive business, especially as we go into high season for next year. Because as you all know, and, and, and you know very well, that's when we make our hay. Um, and so we need to go through and make sure that we're doing everything we can to, uh, to go through and, and push that business. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, uh, again, it's from a, a work plan standpoint. Um, and again, we've enjoyed working with Shane um, and, and, and coming up with the programs there. But I think really, uh, uh, I think really on that one, strategic plan is going to be critical for us. And I mentioned that because that helps define where we go from a future standpoint. And I do want to say that's also a that uh, strategic plan that we're doing. We are also pulling in with that um, creative Pinellas so that we have a comprehensive plan overall. And that is something that we'll be starting as uh, in, in the fall. Um, and hopefully that by spring, we'll be able to really have results from that. And then the other item I wanted to mention was on Super Bowl. Um, and they presented to the TDC in February, which was our last meeting. And the instructions from the TDC was at that point uh, to sit down with the folks from Super Bowl and then come back. And that dollar amount may not be the dollar amount that we settle on, um, but at least to have the conversations uh, with them. So uh, I just want, wanted to make you aware of that. Yeah. <clears throat> Commissioner Seal. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I think you partially answered some of my questions, Steve, but um, in the funding um, request, is Creative Pinellas receiving the same amount that they did in this past budget or is that still being determined? Um, the dollar amount that we have in there for this year is a reduced amount based on that with fact that we had a reduced budget overall. Um, and then at, if our funding goes up, then that could be something to be uh, considered to uh, increase that funding as well. Could you give me a specific dollar amount, what it was uh, and what it was? I want to say, and pardon me as I look here. I want to say that it before it was like eight hundred and some thousand. Yeah, it was eight hundred. It was eight hundred ninety-six thousand dollars in the original submission, and the revised budget is five hundred thirty-seven thousand. So it's a three hundred and just under three hundred sixty thousand uh, dollar reduction from the original request. Okay. And, um, yeah. Sorry. No. Go ahead. Uh, my next question, and uh, Steve, you answered this partially about the Super Bowl and um, discussing the 1.5 million request. Um, where is the Visit Tampa Bay and what were they originally going to fund? And I know that their reductions in staff have been much more than ours will be. Um, so originally, what were they being requested to fund and 
what's he anticipated there? Um, I, Commissioner, I don't know the exact answer to that. I do know that theirs was a combination of what was Visit Tampa Bay putting in, what was the Sports Commission uh, putting in, um, and I think then it was what was Hillsborough County putting in. And I don't recall the dollar amount for that, but I believe it was all of that was more than what Pinellas would put in. And, and I have not had a conversation with uh, the Tampa Bay, the, with the host committee or with Santiago um, related to this since the original discussion in February. Yeah, the, um, the original, what was uh, presented was the state of Florida, the Florida Sports Foundation would, uh, would put in 1.5 million. Uh, Visit Tampa would put in 1 million. The Tampa Sports Commission would put in 1 million. City of Tampa, I believe, is uh, contributing in kind services. And then Hillsborough County TDC is uh, putting in 3 million. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. And um, <clears throat> the other question I had, and it may not be the appropriate time to discuss it, but obviously we had had ongoing discussions with the Phillies and I don't know where the rates are at this point. Um, but that being said, that may be a discussion for another day. Um, but I am grateful that we started reserving greater reserves over the last few years because we certainly would be in a horrific position if we had allowed other uses of the TDC funds and if we had expended it and made some other capital um, commitments. So um, we're thankfully in a solid position because of those reserves. Thank you. And Commissioner, we've had no discussion since everything has happened with COVID um, with the Phillies. Okay, I thought so, but I just was asking. Thank you. Uh, yes, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Um, I'll work backwards uh, just for Commissioner Seal. Um, the numbers uh, that I think Jim gave us align with our latest budget discussion at Creative Pinellas. They built in about a 40% reduction. And I think that number lines up. I'm looking at the spreadsheet about 540,000 is what we're anticipating. Um, wanted to ask Steve, I guess I'm hope, hoping to get to meet you in person before I leave the commission, <laughs> but I uh, still haven't had a chance to sit down with you, but um, welcome aboard again. Uh, I'd like to get a copy of your PowerPoint that you went through. I don't think we have that specific PowerPoint that you went through, if you could send that. Okay. And the last thing, can you refresh me? You've got a sheet um, that Jim went through that showed our commitments to Blue Jays, the Dolly Museum on their current project, uh, American Craftsman, City of Clearwater, um, refresh me where we are with Tampa Bay Watch and with the Dolly's new proposal. So I believe Tampa Bay Watch, uh, they, uh, I think you approved yesterday the agreement. Um, and so that's, that's moving forward. Um, as far as the Dolly, uh, we are in negotiations with their agreement in order to bring that back. Uh, to the, the uh, county commission uh, from there. So the Baywatch dollars, would they be considered commitments that? that they, they are not currently in the, the budget, but uh, we'll have to look at when they anticipate completion. Uh, I, th that would be both with the Florida Holocaust Museum and the Tampa Bay Watch. Uh, we have the Florida Holocaust Museum in the budget at 350,000. If they're not going to be able to complete it within the year, uh, within the fiscal year, then we would not need to add anything for the for the Tampa Bay Watch if they do complete it. But if there's if they both anticipate completing it within the FY twenty one, we would need to add three hundred thousand dollars to uh, to that part. And the, the but there is um, there are funds available based on our projections uh, to increase it by the the three hundred thousand. Okay, and I know TDC hasn't met yet, but the Dolly, are, are you recommending that be a part of the one year 
um, hiatus or what's the handling that you're recommending for the dolly, Steve? Well, I think uh, first is to have a better understanding of when the fund, the funds of that project um, and when they would look to even start that project and when the funds or when the project would be completed, that whole, whole process. And again, uh, Commissioner, as I uh, continue my on the job training with this new position, as I learn all of the, the different elements of that, if, if I misspoke in some way, I'm hoping Jim or Bill can uh, correct me. Yeah, the, the, the way the, the plan is set up now, it's based on reimbursement. So the project would need to be completed uh, before we would make payments. And I don't believe that there's um, any chance of them completing that in FY21. Uh, we don't even have the agreement yet. Um, and I know that there was discussion on potentially changing, uh, that they would have requested a change in that policy. But uh, the way we would do it is um, under the current setup is when they complete the project, we would, uh, provide them with reimbursement up to the amount in the agreement um, at that time. Okay. Thank you. Sure, Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, uh, I want that's part of what I wanted to get clarity on the Tampa Bay Watch and the Holocaust that we just approved. So those are going to be in the 2021 budget because we'll be the last dollars, not the first dollars kind of thought process. Yes, the, the Florida Holocaust is in the current request. Uh, the Tampa Bay watch is not. And if there is uh, expectation that that money would be uh, reimbursable within FY21, we would, it, we would need to add that to the budget or shift some money around within their request. And, and we, uh, you have this great um, forecast or whatever you want to call it for the capital funding uh, program out. If we could get an updated copy of that uh, to the best of your ability, that'd be wonderful because what I'm looking at, for fiscal year 21, the only commitments are 200,000 for Philly Spring Training and then the 5 million for the beach nourishment. There's no other, um, there's no other commitments in the fiscal year 2021 on the, the latest sheet I have. I don't know if I don't have a- No, it, uh, you probably do not have the, the most current one um, because I think at the time we were anticipating that the, uh, the Clearwater, or the Countryside Sports Complex would have been finished in the current fiscal year, but uh, they haven't asked for reimbursement that I know of yet. Um, so our agreement with them is to split it over two years. And if if we haven't spent anything, so we will update update that with uh, with the COVID projections as well and, and all of the uh, projects. But but you're correct. We have we have very few projects committed in 21. But for example, for the, like you bring up the countryside, that is, that is committed. That's not a new commitment. So it's still, Correct. that won't impact like the bottom line of what reserves we have because we're showing in 2021, again, if nothing changed and not talking about the 600,000 we just approved of $22 million, obviously all of that's changed now, but um, that was, I think some of the, uh, because we had some of those good years and we were able to do some of those projects in two or three years, instead of spreading it out over 10 years, we were able to pay off those, uh, those commitments very quickly and, and be in the position that we're at. And so I think that was, uh, it's paying dividends as they say. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else for CVD? Yes. If, if you'd like, we can show that uh, capital funding program updated sheet right now, if that's the desire of the board. Uh, Sure, but can you also send it to us? Absolutely. Thank you. Bill, do you have that pulled up or do you want me to pull yes, it up? Yes, I'm gonna yeah, pull correct. that up right now for you. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. So Jim, if you wanna kind of walk through and just orient uh, where we're at right now and what's in there, what's not in there. Yes, um, as you can see at the top, the, the budget we had anticipated $24.6 million uh, flowing into the capital portion. Am I, I want to make sure I'm not muted. Uh, we're on the capital portion of, um, for FY20. FY20. Um, we had a half million dollars in there for the Dali, uh, just under $600,000 for the Phillies and then 5.1 for beach nourishment. So we had uh, ongoing uh, projects, which were done bef prior to the, existence of the capital funding program of $6.2 million. Um, we are finishing the 
the two million dollar payment to the Craftsman Museum is the last of the three two million dollar payments that we committed to them. Uh, we have four hundred thousand or three hundred fifty thousand dollars in the FY twenty budget for the Florida Holocaust Museum uh, at the request of Commissioner Seal, I believe. Uh, they are not going to be able to expend that this year, so that funding will um, will roll to next year. Uh, so that that sh uh, will not be in the estimate when we give the the next update. Um, countryside sports complex uh, they still could have uh, a, a request in this year uh, and if they do then we will spend it and then there still would be the need for the another nine hundred fifty thousand dollars in the second year because the total commitment was 1.85 million dollars um, so if there's a um, if there's a request this year then uh, that is in the budget uh, already and then accounted for. And then for the Blue Jays, um, we budgeted $33.2 million. Uh, they had a, um, a little extra spending at the end of last year that was higher than what we had in the estimate. So uh, the, est the actual that we spent was $11.6 million. Um, so what was left over for FY20 and the rest of the project, I should say, is $29.6 million. Uh, to date, uh, We've paid out $16.4 million uh, on that project in this, this fiscal year. Uh, I spoke with uh, uh, Doug Hutchins at, in the city of uh, Dunedin a few weeks ago, and uh, they are expecting to send us uh, several more invoices this year. And um, they are hoping to get everything done in this fiscal year, but depending on timing, some of it might roll over to next fiscal year. If that's the case, then we'll adjust the, the budget as needed. Um, so at the bottom, we have potential um, commitments. And you know we're still working on the, the Philly spring training um, request. So none of that's going to be spent this year. Um, the St. Pete Historical Society, there was a, a potential for $2.8 million, uh, which I don't believe is uh, going through the the Dolly Museum. This was uh, we were anticipating a two or three year project, and then a one time payment to them. Uh, at the time, I think it was seventeen and a half million dollars. Uh, I don't know if that figure has changed, but we didn't anticipate paying anything on that until project completion in FY22 or later. Uh, and then Tampa Bay Watch, we also had a, um, we had it, it's not in the budget, but we did have it as something that would potentially happen in FY20 at $300,000. So um, there, are, it's showing that we would be um, uh, uh, just under a million dollars in the deficit for FY20 in the capital. Um, I, I don't think that that's where we're going to be once we get the, uh, we'll update this again, like I said, um, that will include everything that we have committed to, which would be the Tampa Bay watch and the, uh, and make sure that's in the budget as well. So what's the date on this one, Bill? This one was dated in uh, on May 11th, so okay. a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so um, we we do have more updated numbers uh, for FY21 uh, that are better uh, than the 15.4 million dollars. Um, but I have not updated this chart since uh, uh, since we re, uh, redid their budget for uh, uh, for. Uh, FY21. I think that gives a good idea. So. Yes, we'll, we'll get that updated. I have a question, this Dave. Um, on on these on this lower box down here, um, potential commitments. I could you refresh my mind, uh, my memory about um, which one of those? Uh, I guess I'm seeing one, two, three, four projects we've actually voted on to give money to uh i believe you just uh you just approved the tampa bay watch uh, and i think the 
the dolly that we're still going through the agreement so i don't believe that that's been brought back but we but uh, we to, voted we voted on to approve that one correct i, I believe you voted not to the, not the, not the contract but but the project in concept yes and um uh, and same thing with the historical society that i don't remember Ter uh, steve or terry um, on that one um on the the historical society uh there were still in discussions on the marketing benefits but they've paused their construction planning so it sounds like that project might be taking a little bit longer so we have not voted to approve that project yet now, i'm not talking about the contract i'm just talking about the concept the concept yeah i think I think the concept was approved. It's just the okay. agreement is was the next step. Yeah. So the the low the lower three uh, have, have we conceptually approved? Actually, I think uh, all four of them you did. Um, I, no. And I, I th no, 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 no. You haven't done the Phillies, Jim. Okay. We haven't done anything with the Phillies. Well, okay. no, that's that's actually uh, just to clarify the conceptual approval that was provided for the Dolly was the same conceptual approval that was provided for the Phillies. Okay. And we're in negotiations with both of those parties. Okay. Tampa Bay Watch has been fully executed and approved as of yesterday. Well, oh, hold on a minute. When you say conceptually, we've approved the you approved forty staff. million dollars. I'm sorry. Say it again. What? You, what sorry, you, didn't, you didn't approve the amount. We just said you directed staff to begin negotiations with the Phillies. Okay. So, not a, not a dollar commitment, but you approve the concept of us setting down with them and negotiating. And that's the and same. I think that's the same thing with the dolly. Okay. Okay. So we haven't committed to any dollar amount yet. Correct. Either Correct. either product. Correct. The other two we have. The agreements. The final agreement was approved yesterday along with the Holocaust Museum. So that one's all set, ready to go. Historical. St. Pete Historical Society is in negotiations, as Steve said, as it relates to the marketing components of that. That one's on a different, a slightly different path um, because of the fact, the dollar amount. So if you recall the capital funding program guidelines distinguish it based on dollar amount. So once it crosses a certain dollar threshold, and if I remember correctly, I believe it's $10 million as a threshold, but I may be wrong on that because it's been a while since I've looked at it. Um, but once you cross that threshold, we have a multi-step process. And the intent of that is to make sure we don't invest time and energy on both parties if there's not conceptual approval from the board of actually negotiating and bring back forward a fully executed or, or the opportunity for a fully executed agreement. Yeah, I just, I just, I think, yeah, you're right. I just want to make sure that we're clear on, on those different, uh, probably three different le levels here. One is an actual commitment. The other is a concept a agreement to just go out and concept to start negotiations. And then the other one is just, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're kind of approving the deal now, but not the contract itself. So it, it gets a little confusing based on some terminology here. So I just want to make sure we're, we're clear on that. Thank you. I agree. Agree. There are absolutely different versions of approvals yeah. that can be confusing. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. We have anything else for CB CBB? Okay, thank you, Steve. Great, thank you. That was all we had for CBB. Uh, did Commissioner Seal, did you have a question from before? You answered it. It was about the St. Petersburg Historical Museum. I didn't know we had talked about all the rest of the capital projects, but um, not okay. that one. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe before we jump to economic development next, um, I just want to share uh, and uh, thank Don Kroll for uh, looking up the Treasury guidelines related to CARES Act and the question about whether those funds could be used to satisfy property tax obligations. Uh, the frequently asked questions that they have published already had a question specifically on that topic, and it specifically states that they cannot. Cannot. 
Okay. That is not an allowable use. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And next up, we have Jason Rivera to uh, start us off with economic development. Good morning, Jason Rivera, Office of Management and Budget. And uh, as Bill said, I'll be here to discuss economic development. And to kick it off, I will hand it over to Shane Kunza, who will be discussing their performance summary and um, their work plan. Shane? Shane, you're muted. You have to unmute. All right, last time today. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right, economic development has retired the Qualified Target Industry Work Plan Initiative because the program was defunded by the state legislature uh, through this, uh, this year, and it will cease to exist as of July 1st. Um, economic development is currently working through a strategic plan as well, and uh, they are expecting to add additional key performance indicators um, through this process. Like tourism, COVID-19 has also greatly uh, impacted and disrupted the business community at large with an estimated 70,000 or 75,000 jobs temporarily lost. Economic development continues to play a key role in assisting businesses with local, state, and federal loans and grants, including the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, and the CARES Act. They also assist in expanding the manufacturing and sourcing of alternative and conventional PPE in the county. Due to the staff focus on COVID-19 related support, two of their work plan initiatives will be impacted. There will be a delay on the rollout of the Penny Four Employment Sites Program and the exploration of a regional Tampa Bay marketing program with partner organizations by at least one quarter. Uh, that's all I have at this time. Uh, and this is my last presentation of the day. So unless you have questions, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Questions? Rolling to the budget portion. Okay. Go ahead, Jason. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Please let me know when you can see that. Got it. Okay, so we're gonna start up here with a high uh, level view of economic development's budget. Uh, the request for FY21, as you can see, this is a department that is 78% uh, personal services, 18.7% operating, and about 3% grants and aids. So it's a, it's a department that's heavily, uh, you know, th their main expense is personal services, which presents its own challenges when you're trying to make some uh, cuts in operating or you know, re realize some operational efficiencies. Um, they are anticipated to have COVID impacts in FY, in the current year estimate. Uh, right now, their revenues, uh, they generate revenues through grants and user fees for workshop registrations and exhibitor fees. Um, because of the safer at home orders that have been uh, put forth by the state, uh, they have reduced their current year estimates for those workshop and uh, exhibitor fee revenues by 50% or just under 15,000. Uh, there's no anticipated impact right now for grant revenues. And um, as we'll see later on, there's no impact moving forward uh, into FY21. Uh, expenditures, they are, uh, again, a large portion of their operating budget consists of travel and per diem and registration fees associated with conferences to promote the state as a business destination. Uh, with the safer at home orders and the travel restrictions, they are reducing the current year estimates uh, by 63000 across two of their programs. So, uh, you know, to account for that. Um, they, with the safer at home orders and travel restrictions being lifted, uh, they don't anticipate the uh, impacts to operating or revenues in FY21. There might be a virtual component to some of those workshops that they're going to um, have and maybe even some of the uh, conferences that they would normally attend. But right now, we don't know what that looks like. So we're going to keep 21 budget requests as that was submitted by the department for now. Um, Here's a revenue uh, information for the department. Again, the majority of their revenues are grant related revenues, which are recorded here in program 1486. Uh, program 1485 revenues are primarily those user fee revenues, as I mentioned, which are associated with those workshops and um, exhibitor fees. Right now, they're not proposing a change to those user fees. Uh, the user fees are based on industry standard 
for business education classes that are provided within the statewide Florida Small Business Development Center network. And they're not intended to be a revenue source for the organization. Uh, instead, they are intended to be reinvested uh, back into that program to provide those services. Here's an overall summary of their operating expenditures. Um, as mentioned uh, at the top, Program 424, their grants and aids, those are QTI incentives. Um, those fluctuate annually based off of the number of applications that are submitted and approved for those um, uh, incentives. And right now that qualified target incentive program is scheduled to sunset at the end of this current month. Um, but we are anticipating that there will still be payments that will be made through fiscal year 30. And the, so the sunsetting of that program right now is going to impact the department's ability to attract new jobs moving into FY21. Um, but right now that decrease is just based off of the current applications for uh, businesses that have applied. Their program 1485, Business Attention, Expansion and Attraction, again, it's heavily uh, driven by personal services, which does show an increase, but their operating expenditures are decreasing by just under 4%. Um, and those decreases are really a net effect of several changes that were made in their operating budget. So the main drivers of those are listed here on this page. There are increases to accommodate the purchase of Incent Track, which is a software to provide the ability to track their incentive programs. We also have an increase to accommodate uh, Team Tampa Bay Partnerships and uh, Area Development Forum Trade Shows, an increase for uh, annual costs associated with Neighborly, which is the program that will be used to track the Penny for Employment Sites program applications, and it's also being used right now for the CARE Small Business Grant Program. Uh, but that's being offset by some decreases, such as the $50,000 decrease for the seed money for AmSkills, which has ended, the decreases for some sponsorships, um, such as the Team Tampa Bay Defense Alliance, or Tampa Bay Defense Alliance, apologies, um, the reduction for uh, Impact Data Source subscription, that purchasing was able to negotiate a, a better rate for them, and then they're realigning 53,000 for um, to engage an advertising agency specializes in international and national advertising, such as the agency used by Convention Visitors Bureau. Uh, right now, there's no anticipated changes in the operating expenditures for their small business assistance program. Um, only change being made in that, of course, would be the uh, changes in personal services, which are a result of the um, Evergreen study, as well as the uh, countywide salary adjustment. Does anybody have any questions related to uh, budget information? Okay. Okay, Mike, go With ahead. That, I'll turn it over to Mike. Going to be the fact that uh, all of our staff are currently processing the Pinellas Cares Grant Program, and we have staff from all over the county that have joined us. And I want to thank the other department directors for loaning us some of their best people because we've got a, a crew of about 50 folks right now from various departments working on reviewing the applications. Plus, the clerk's uh, finance office has 16 staff doing auditing and check processing and the inspector general has three doing fraud detection and, and further auditing. So we have quite a team going on that, but with the PPE program taking up most of April and the CARES grant May and June, um, we are going to be about three months behind on all of our performance measures, particularly the Penny 4 rollout of uh, reaching out to developers and, uh, and making that notice of funding availability available and uh, being able to take applications and so on. Um, we are using the Neighborly software for that program, so we're getting excellent experience with all of the small business grants, but, um, but right now we're, we're looking at uh, just an overall three month delay. Other than that, we're, we're looking to move forward. I think the biggest thing we're, we're doing differently now is that the international trade effort um, has obviously been travel oriented where we've taken people to actually meet face to face with uh, potential buyers overseas. We are working with the state of Florida now on a virtual program that will allow um, these uh, local companies to meet in a Zoom meeting or Teams meeting format with their potential customers overseas. 
Uh, the state government is still looking at grant programs to uh, provide the funding for that. It, uh, we, we hope that it'll be hugely successful and we'll actually be able to expand the number of companies that can uh, take advantage of this program because they won't have their own travel expenses to cover. So uh, that'll be a work in progress, but uh, we'll, we'll keep you informed on how that works out for us. Um, other than that, um, doing more virtual counseling for the small business development centers. Yeah, we are getting experience with that, um, mostly through the USF system, our, our 10 county area uh, for the Small Business Development Center is putting together these videos and online webinars. And uh, we're pointing people to that while our staff works on the Small Business uh, CARES grant program. So we'll uh, be able to continue that moving forward, but I'm sure we'll still uh, take advantage of the opportunity in the future to have that one-on-one -on -one counseling when the uh, COVID experience is, has uh, died down a little bit. But the experience that we've had with um, using Zoom meetings and team meetings, both internally and externally, I think will give us benefits going forward. Uh, as you know, we're about 30 minutes from the downtown campus, so just saving that one-hour drive for the meetings is going to help us in productivity and uh, to save some of the uh, small businesses from having to come into our office or even to our local chambers, uh, we'll save them time and money as well. So we, we think there'll be benefits to this in the long term. That's all I had, are there any questions? Yes, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mike, thanks for the great job you and your staff are doing. Um, on the QTI, what, what was the rationale for the state um, sunsetting that and how do you fill that gap? Yeah, the um, that program has been on and off for quite a while, uh, especially with the current leadership and the past leadership in the House and the Senate. Um, it was perceived as a corporate welfare type program, which, um, which it really wasn't because the entire program was designed on reimbursement after the jobs were created, at the wages they said they were going to be, after they made the capital investment, after they paid their taxes, and then it was spread out over a four-year period to ensure that they continue to benefit the local economy. But all of that said, the uh, legislature did chose to allow it to sunset. There's a chance it could come back in the future. Uh, the actual enacting legislation was not struck. It's just the, uh, it has sunset, but uh, could potentially be brought back. Um, in the meantime, uh, as was mentioned in our budgeting discussion, there are, most of these are spread out over seven years, um, and they, of course, will continue to fund that. Uh, going forward at the state level, 80% of those future payments are going to be funded by the state and 20% by city and county partnerships. So those will we'll continue to see those going forward. Um, in replacement of that, we're going to see more use of the ad valorem tax exemption that uh, voters approved a few years ago and that you have set up the resolutions for. In fact, on June 23rd, we were going to bring a company to you, a uh, local firm that is expanding and that could uh, benefit from this ad valorem tax exemption program. So we'll see the shift in that direction. We'll see more emphasis on the training programs, on working with career source now that they are beginning our normal operations and recovery from the problems they've had in the past. We'll see the uh, employed worker training, incumbent worker training programs, on the job training programs all begin to uh, ramp up again and we will definitely promote and work with those programs. Okay, thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm sorry, Commissioner Seal. Um, going to AMP skills, <clears throat> so it's um, fifty thousand less. But what is the contribution? And um, I thought we were ready to sunset that this year. Yes. Yes. No. It will. It will end um, in July fifteenth. We are working with the lawyers. Uh, a five hundred one c three organization has been set up. The board members have been appointed. Uh, attorneys are working on the documents that will actually transfer all of the assets and responsibilities to the 501c3. And uh, our, our current three-year um, 
uh, interlocal agreement is set to expire on July 15th. And our goal there is to make sure that it does and that all of the assets are transferred prior to that date. So that will end this fiscal year. Okay, great. And I think you answered the question to Commissioner Welch, but just I want to repeat it so that I have clarity. So even though the state defunded it, they will still continue to um, support the QTIs that have been approved been approved in the past. Correct. Okay. And then um, the economic um, the ad valorem exemption. I know we had I would say three requests over the past year but I don't recall coming back with firm agreements that any of them were approved. Correct. Uh, we're working on one right now that because of the construction slowdown in some cases, the companies um, only have to get it in before it actually hits the tax rolls. So some of those are being delayed. Um, some of them are delayed due to the changes in uh, construction plans, but the only ones you've passed so far are those that kind of preserve the ability to uh, bring you the ordinance at a later date. So we haven't brought to you yet an actual um, time and money type uh, ordinance that would put it into place. So those are all, all three are kind of on hold, but we'll, we'll probably see them again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mike? If I can, just while Mike's on the line, you know, him and his team really stepped up during um, the COVID and re working with local businesses on remanufacturing and delivering PPE and other things that they could do. So him and his team really stepped up on that and, and, and pulled in a lot of resources. So I wanted to thank him, let you know the good job that he did on that. Uh, thank you. Well, and we want to thank our local companies for stepping up, uh, particularly Matico, as they went from window film manufacturing to face shields uh, that have been utilized by our employees, by our first responders, and are now available to everyone in the local community. So that's just our biggest success story. We had many others where people are are joining in our efforts. And uh, the St. Pete Chamber has taken over that effort now while we work on the small business grants and are putting together a database that will connect local businesses to providers of, uh, local providers of protective equipment and sanitizers. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Great, thank you. Okay. Next issue. Commissioners, um, so that was economic development. Next up is building development review. You can um, keep moving on or take a break, however, whatever you desire. Uh, how do the rest of you feel about taking a break or not? I will follow your lead, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Um, Anything I can do to help. For what it's worth, yeah. we, we had uh, estimated times for each of the presenters were about 45 minutes ahead, and the next oh. quote-unquote presenter would have been our lunch break. Okay. Um, so uh, just for whatever that offers to making the decision. Okay, then. Well, that makes sense. Um, can we take a uh, half-hour break then and let us realign people to the schedule? Thank you. All right. Uh, come back at 1230. All righty.
turn it over to you for, it looks like we got development review next. Yep, uh, we have building development review services. Um, so I will kick it over to Cecilia and we can um, line people up for Bill. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Jason Miller is going to uh, start us off with building development review services and he's also going to be the uh, budget lead as far as the uh, contractor licensing as well. All right, Jason, you're on. All right, just bring my screen up here. Let me know if everybody can see that. Yep. Okay, great, thank you. My name, uh, as Bill said, Jason Miller, the budget analyst for the Building and Development Review Services Department. I'm joined today by Belinda Amundsen, who is our performance management analyst, as well as Blake Lyon, who is the department director for Building and Development Review. Uh, just to lay some quick groundwork for, um, just so everybody knows that building and development review is uh, three divisions, building services, which does the building permits and inspections, our development review services division, which evaluates development proposals, and the code enforcement division, which ensures compliance with local courts and codes and ordinances. So with that being said, I'd like to hand it over to Belinda to go over some of the performance aspects of the department. Thank you, Jason. Good afternoon. I am Belinda Amundsen, the Strategic Performance Management Analyst for Building and Development Review Services, starting the discussion this afternoon with the performance summary of the department. The department is leading a multi-phase and multi-department initiative to evaluate the county's development review process. The first phase of this project has been completed, and this included a consultant that was hired to prepare a review of all the processes and the departments that were providing support to this system. Uh, phase two of this is approximately 60% complete, and this includes several groups that are developing recommendations for improvements. Uh, the recommendation report is estimated to be delivered in February of 2021, and once that occurs, phase three will begin for implementing the approved recommendations for the system. Uh, moving on, SELA is a program that will replace Permits Plus for the department. It is expected to improve customer and citizen experience. Um, along with that, there is data that the department wants to capture, but doing so right now is very time consuming and a very manual process. And that is even if the data is able to be captured at all. Uh, so Acela will certainly assist the departments uh, with capturing more data automatically and therefore assist the department in measuring its performance easier and more holistically. Um, there are a few initiatives that have been delayed due to COVID. Each of these initiatives have been delayed by about one to three months due to the COVID response efforts and the court closures. Uh, the other COVID impacts, uh, the number of permits issued decreased by nearly 22%, which will have a negative impact on the building services fund revenues. Um, on the flip side, the number of building inspections requested has also decreased. And as a result, building services is now able to perform all the inspections in-house and has released their building inspection contractor, at least for the time being. And uh, this will result in an offsetting positive impact to the building services fund for at least an unknown period of time. Uh, that includes this portion and I'll pass the discussion over to Jason unless there are any questions. Okay, so on to opportunities for efficiency um, within the department. The department continues to work on its multi-focus pilot program that Belinda mentioned. Um, this program is geared toward gaining efficiencies um, by having employees cross-trained between different disciplines rather than just uh, their sole discipline. For example, if a building inspector is out uh, on a property and they see maybe a, a code enforcement issue or a, a contractor licensing issue, they can act on that rather than um, notifying somebody in a different department and having to come out and, and um, work on it after the fact. Uh, additionally, the uh, implementation of Acela later this year, as Belinda mentioned, will also have a number of further efficiencies. And once it's uh, live, the department is also going to be exploring some uh, further efficiencies by some add-on items, which you can see listed below. Um, there is one decision package for the department, which is uh, requesting additional resources to augment 
um, staff with consultant services. Uh, these consultants would just help with any um, work backlog and you know, improve the overall timeline for the customer to get a, a project moved. And that request comes with a $100,000 annual request. Moving into potential threats that the department faces. The, there is a structural imbalance in the building services fund. Uh, the fund will need to raise revenues, reduce its expenditures or do some combination of both to be able to sustain itself into the future. Um, a fee study was completed uh, I believe in late July of 2019, where the consultant had provided uh, a few different scenarios, all of which included uh, a drastic percentage increase to the fee levels. So not wanting to spike them that much, the department uh, for the current fiscal year 20 did an average of 10% increase uh, across the board, across all their fees. Um, so that's still proving uh, to not be enough. Additionally, there are a number of municipalities that we provide inspection services for. I believe there's five at the current time, um, a number of others on an as-needed basis. So if other municipal, municipalities decide to um, explore us doing those services for them, and maybe a, a balance of, of workload that needs to be performed where we're able to meet our own needs and our own um, customers' needs rather than overextending ourselves by the municipality. Um, the department's also exploring whether all inspections need to be done on a next day basis. Um, they currently are done that way, but if there's the opportunity for any inspections to be done on a, a two or three day, uh, within a two or three day window and help out with workload levels, then the department would be looking into exploring those possibilities. Um, building services also has been using contractual inspectors to meet the need um, for inspections demanded. And uh, we're currently in the third year of a five-year agreement. The price that we currently have with the, the contractor is um, very good and well below market rate. So when that, that when that uh, contract goes to be renegotiated or renewed, uh, the department does anticipate to see um, a likely higher rate, maybe, maybe doubling. Uh, building services also has been losing its building inspectors to other municipalities, um, neighboring municipalities. Um, they're being taken away for higher pay at the, the neighboring municipalities. So the county still does lag a little bit in the market with regards to inspector pay. And then the continued monitoring of the two new uh, laws that went into effect in 2019 with regards to private providers where citizens can have um, private companies do their plan reviews and or inspections and also, uh, the tree removal where this allows homeowners or property owners to no longer come to the county for a tree removal permit, so long as a, a certified arborist or landscape architect uh, deems, deems the tree able to be removed. So both of those items uh, can have a negative impact on the department's revenue, although they haven't been widely used uh, to this point. It's still something to keep monitoring and keep a pulse on. And I'm sure as you know, with every other department, the future inf uh, impacts of COVID-19, uh, so long as the construction industry remains um, positive and healthy, um, there, will, there may be a, a corresponding decrease in revenues you know, if that tends to go south. Uh, moving on to the budget summary with our staffing levels. Staffing levels remain at the same of uh, 104.8 full-time employees. And then we have a few tables with regards to revenue and expenditure numbers. 
that we can dive into right here with our revenues. So overall as a department, um, again, three different divisions, which are across two different funds, code enforcement and development review being in the general fund and building services being in its own special revenue fund. Revenues are decreasing by just over $84,000 or um, 1% compared to the current year's budget. Now, if we look at it division by division, um, we can see that 20 estimates for code enforcement have decreased um, by about $62,000 uh, due to the number of research uh, for liens done on people purchasing property. So since that's um, slowed to some extent, we're anticipating a, a reduced revenue for that item. And then in fiscal year 21, we show the revenues increasing overall um, across many different revenue streams by a, a similar amount, 62,000 or 7.2% 7 over the 20 budget. And most of that is just with regards to budgeting at a level that's more um, in line with actual revenues that we've been seeing over the past couple of years. Uh, we tend to be fairly conservative, so we're just trying to find that next level and creep up on it instead of um, increasing it or reducing it wildly year after year. Uh, moving into development review services, those revenue estimates are decreasing by about $75,000 uh, for the fiscal year 20 estimate. And that's due to some COVID-19 uh, related impacts with regards to, um, you know, maybe not as many projects are going to be starting um, while people wait to see what's going to happen. So just a, a slight reduction with regards to those revenues for the current year. And then for fiscal year 21, uh, overall, again, many different revenue streams increase by a total of 301,000 uh, over the current year. And that's again, trying to get closer to those actual numbers that we, we experienced over the past few years. Um, later on, when we get into user fee changes, um, $114,000 of that number uh, would be from modified or increased uh, or new fees proposed for fiscal year 21. On to building services, our 20 fiscal year 20 estimates are decreasing by about $1.4 million um, or 20% due to COVID-19. Again, the department has seen uh, a lower number of permits issued. So that number corresponds with, with that uh, reduction. We are keeping an eye on that to see if things uh, improve. And for fiscal year 21, there will be a revenue decrease of approximately 508,000 or 7.2% from the revenues while there still may be some lingering uh, COVID impact. Onto the expenditures. Again, high level picture department wide of the three divisions across the two funds, total expenditures um, are decreasing by approximately $870,000 or almost 7%. When we go into each division, code enforcement, code enforcement has a, a reduced expenditure estimate by uh, $21,000 and that's due to less travel and training needed as um, you know, conferences have been canceled and, and no expenses. Um, associated with that will be used. And code enforcement, code enforcement's 21 budget request uh, totals $2.2 million, and that's um, 21,000 or 1% below the current year's budget. Uh, diving in a little bit deeper, just to look at that categorically, personnel services uh, increase by about $73,000 while operating expenses decrease almost $95,000. That's largely in part to the department budgeting um, more in line with actual experienced expenditures with regards to their demolition budget. Into development review services, 
Uh, fiscal year 20 estimates have decreased by about $22,000, again, as, as part of uh, COVID and reduced need for travel and training expenses. Their total fiscal year 21 budget request is uh, $2.6 million, which is about $169,000 below the current year's budget. Categorically, the personnel service costs have decreased by uh, almost $139,000. And that's a result of a, a workload shift where there's a higher activity with uh, right-of-way utilization permits. So while those while those activities are higher, those costs are actually expended to the Transportation Trust Fund. With regards to their operating expenses, they have decreased almost $40,000, um, and that's mainly due to the reduction in the, the need for a temporary employee. And their capital expenses have slightly increased due to the need of uh, replacing a printer and copier that's past its useful life. Into building services again, which is its own fund. The 20 year expenditure estimates are decreasing by $115,000 due to the, again, the less permitting activity and fewer number of inspections, as well as just like the other two divisions, fewer needs for travel and training. Uh, the FY21 budget request is approximately $7 million, which is almost uh, or $680,000 below the current year. Um, personnel service costs slightly decreased by $5,400 due to, uh, as we mentioned before, those inspectors leaving and we have a, a turnover where the newer employees are being brought in at a lower level. So there's a slight uh, decrease to personal services costs fiscal year 21 because of the new employees. Operating expenses decrease um, almost $700,000. That's in part to a lower cost for uh, business technology services costs with regards to uh, the Acela project. And, their, and the department's contractual services budget uh, decreasing by $125,000 because of that reduced need for contractual inspectors. Uh, lastly, building services capital outlay um, increased by almost $12,000. And again, that's, that's also due to a need for a, a new printer and copier that's past its useful life. And on to user fee changes. There are a number of proposed fee changes for the department. Uh, first, we'll look at code enforcement. They have uh, one new fee proposed and one fee proposed to increase. So the new fee that they're pro proposing is a lien settlement administrative fee. And for the lien recipient, um, the owner, the amount would be included in their lien settlement process. But if, if you're a non-lien holder, maybe a prospective investor for that property uh, looking to purchase it, uh, there will be a new fee of $300. And that's estimated to bring an additional revenue of uh, approximately $600,000. The fee that's proposed to increase is for after Madam hours. Chair. Oh. Yes. May, may I ask a question right there? Certainly. So I, I thought I heard you say, this is under code enforcement general fund that for a non-lean holder, non lien holder, the fee is $300, an estimated additional revenue. Did you say 600,000? Uh, 6,000. Yeah, because, I, okay, just wanted to clarify, because I thought I heard you say 600,000. Yeah, if I did, I apologize, my mistake. No worries, I just wanted to make sure I was reading the right thing. Thank you. All right, so for the one fee that's proposed to increase, it's for after hours uh, noise monitoring. Uh, the current fee is $30 with a two hour minimum, and the new rate would be proposed at $55 an hour, uh, again with a two hour minimum. And that's just based on trying to keep um, the rate in line with 
the actual cost it provides, it costs to provide that service. So um, that fee hasn't been changed for about seven years now. So with increased personnel costs, um, the department felt it was um, time to increase that fee to reflect current costs. And that has an estimated additional revenue impact of uh, $1,100. On to development review services, which is in the general fund. Um, there's one fee proposed to increase, and that's for site plan pre-application meetings. Um, that's going to, that's proposed to increase from 250 to $350. And again, I believe that's, that's based on trying to recoup costs for staff time um, taken in those meetings. And that also has a small revenue impact of approximately $1,750. Development review services also proposes six new fees um, for fiscal year 21. I'm gonna uh, kind of ask Blake to join in and give you the visions and walk you through these as, um, as he knows them better than I do. Like you can just hit the highlights on these. We don't have to go through each individual one. Okay. So for a site plan pre-application comment review meeting, um, $350 fee is proposed and that would streamline the plan revision process. Um, revenue impact 35,000. Uh, second one being a site plan pre-application design cons consultation meeting fee of $62 per hour in trying to recover staff uh, time costs. Uh, site plan pre-application consultant review meeting. Um, this is one for uh, maybe a more complex project where um, we would need to reach out to a consultant to help, help us through that process or if, if somebody wanted to um, maybe have it done in a, a faster time frame. This consultant would help with regards to that. And that's structured to be uh, passed through to the customers. So the consultant fees that we would be charged would then be pass, passed on to the, the applicant or the customer. So uh, net zero uh, impact to the department's budget. Uh, they're also proposing a credit card convenience fee, similar to how the utility department um, charges their customers, which is uh, $3.75 per $300 cost increment. Hey, Bill, Bill, not to interrupt, but Bill, are we going to talk about all these? Because we're hitting credit card fees on a lot of different ones. And, um, you know, we also know that cash is not a good way of doing and creates all kinds of audit issues. So I'd like to see us address all of our credit cards with the commission at one time on how we're handling that, just so we can consolidate all these down. Okay, well, we can, uh, as far as these uh, reviews with the board, uh, you know, skip over the specific discussions around each department's concept around this and then bring something back that's holistic. That'd be great, thanks. Okay, and next we have a site plan pre-application conceptual meeting uh, now proposed to carry a, a $50 fee when they had previously been done um, at no cost. And lastly, a site plan pre-application pre-submittal meeting now proposed to carry a $350 fee. And both of those, uh, when those fees are paid, if the if the project decides to move forward, then those those fees can be applied um, as a credit towards other other costs that the project may incur. Within the building services fund, um, there are four new there are four new fees proposed for fiscal year twenty one uh, private provider administration fees, um, a commercial Just related. Fee. So somebody can get an outside review. Is that it, Blake? That's correct. The um, in adoption of uh, seventy one hundred three, 
they provide for the opportunity to have a private provider at the selection of the applicant and the amount of fee structure that the county is able to take in is limited to uh, this administrative fee. So we went through the process of evaluating uh, what it would take for us to do the administrative piece and then these reflect those costs. Okay, so this is all a reflection about the outsourcing option that they created. Correct. Okay, great. Okay, keep moving. We've got these. Okay. Uh, again, a credit card fee, which we already discussed. And then, uh, as I had already mentioned earlier, there there was a 10% average increase to the building fund fees in the current fiscal year. Um, with the, the fund being structurally imbalanced, um, we're still viewing and discussing what another broad-based fee increase may be. Um, at this time, about 9.5%. Uh, in fiscal year 21 across the board would allow the fund to maintain its 15% re reserve level uh, throughout the next five years. Um, and again, that would be the second consecutive year with a, a broad base fee increase. And so Blake, when when would the actual fee increase? Would that be done, Bill or Blake? When would that be done as part of the budget? And when will, um, do we have attached the fees and what the area market, what others are charging for similar services? Do they have that the, information attached? The fee increases, if the budget is adopted, would go into effect with the start of the new fiscal year. So they would go in October 1, 2020, okay. uh, as, the, as the commission approves it. We have uh, provided with the budget submittal request uh, a list of the existing fees and the proposed fees. So you'll see some of those details. And then we're doing that. We've done, as Jason alluded to, we've done that market analysis um, in last year's adoption of the fee schedule. We're doing some updated analysis to make sure we look and see where we are in comparison to other local governments of our size and then also to um, those that are surrounding our community uh, and seeing where we are in terms of our competitive rates. So we're going through that uh, additional review right now. So, um, Commissioner, that's in the back of the, the, the packet. If you don't have it, we'll we'll send that to you. Um, and then the the final piece, and to get off on that is, you know, I wanted Blake. We had talked about taking like a you know a, a uh, commercial expansion and showing kind of the overall impact and what what how we compare stacking up. Sometimes it's hard to look at an individual, you know, a roof or a you know, generator or this or that, but if you look at a typical, you know, uh, remodel project or expansion or something like that, put it, it puts it into context how our fees stack up compared to a neighboring county or St. Petersburg, you know, or Clearwater or something like that. That's correct. We're looking at a couple of different uh, typical or sample type projects to see what we compare when you add all those fees together and kind of what they might get. Okay. So we'll we'll get that together and we'll send that to the commissioners. Yes, that's true. Okay. All right, Jason, is that it? Yes. That was good. Okay. I well, a couple, can I have had a couple of questions? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Appreciate the comment about um, our do our new fees stack up comparably to others in the area we don't have to be the leader but we don't have to be a, a follower let's just be right you know in, in down the middle that was the first question um, the second um in our in the industry it's you, you often get people commenting about how our building department ranks or rates compared to others getting projects through um, so just the idea of having some kind of uh, review performance um kind of feedback from the community how we're doing. I think that's important. And then the third thing that I was going to talk, ask about is um, we seem to be, we're trying to be quick to adjust on, on the fees. How are we doing on, it looks like we're behind on the salaries for our inspectors. How far behind are we? Um, so I, I would, if I can, Commissioner, um, I'd like Blake to kind of do an overview of his department because um, they've actually made a tremendous amount of progress um, 
on implementing the revisions to our building permit process. We're not there yet. I would like us to be further, but there's a number of factors that they um, have uh, run into. We do have a citizen-based committee. That's many of the people that you see and hear about in the community that um, have long histories with land development, building, and um, professional um, certifications and things like that. As a, We use them as a sounding board. We're looking at both process improvements. We're looking at regulatory review, um, and they're they're looking at process improvement within the department. Um, be, you know, because there there's a number of things going on there. Not only have they had probably one of the busiest years they've ever had, um, which has caused them to have to outsource, you know, some of the plan review and stuff. We were implementing a CELA, and we're asking them to take on an entire review of their permit process. So. Um, I beat them up pretty good, but I want to really give them credit because I'll tell you, when I saw the staff review of some of the staff committees working on different pieces of our building code, they were the ones coming up with ideas of how to improve it. They were the ones saying that we can make this regulatory change. It'll make it this much easier to get through that, and it still provides sufficient um, oversight. And so I'd like for Blake to kind of give an overview because they've done a lot of work this past year, and, and I think... You know, we're not there yet, but we're, but we're getting there. So, um, and I think you can answer some of your questions. Thank you. Certainly, thank you for the opportunity. Um, let me address first and foremost, the building inspector piece uh, to give you some clarity. And then I'll uh, touch on Barry's comments about the broader departmental uh, changes and review process we're going through. So one of the things that we've noticed with the building inspectors, the approach that the county has taken in the past is um, there are state requirements when you go through licensing that you have to have a certain number of years within a construction trade industry. And the county has had a practice of being willing to hire people that meet those minimum qualifications, but, but they may not be licensed in building inspection. And so we'll do that and we'll bring in those individuals and then we'll go through the process uh, within their first year to get them a provisional license to help them train, to help them get some on the job training and test to get that license. And what we're finding is that when they then get that license and become an inspector too, that historically our pay scale was uh, lagging the market. And so then you would have these individuals get prized away and go work for other local governments um, at a higher rate. So just to give you a little bit of kind of generic dollars associated with that, and I won't get into any specific employee, but you had the county hiring in, in that 38 dollars to $42,000 range um, for those non-licensed inspectors, we refer to them as inspector ones. And then um, when they got to the inspector two, they got a bump up to uh, 52. Well, in many cases, other municipalities are prizing them away in the high 50s, low 60s. So there's a, you know, in some cases, a $10,000 pay differential uh, to go into those other local governments. And we were finding that we were not able to protect our investments in these employees. And so with some efforts uh, with the county administrator and others, we've been able to adjust those and get them in line a little bit more with the market. We're still lagging the market a bit. Uh, but we have done a little bit more with our uh, benefits package and all the things that go into our compensation structure. We've been able to address the large majority of those issues, but we are still, um, the way I describe it is, you know, we've put a tourniquet on it. We've, we've slowed the bleeding. We haven't entirely stopped it. So we are working. In fact, we better part of this year, we've been going through an audit with the inspector general and they have provided some draft recommendations that we're evaluating further and trying to see if we can address this so we can really retain our our employees and be able to serve our customers uh, in an effective manner. So that's kind of where we are at the moment. We are continuing to evaluate it, but we do need to be mindful of, you know, some of the budget conditions that Jason has mentioned in his comments previously and be able to have the money. Building services has to survive and be able to fund itself on the amount of revenues that they bring in. And so we've been able to address some of those shortfalls. The shortfalls really came forward in two reasons. One is there was a dependence on the contract inspectors like Jason had mentioned. And two is we've had, we're in the second year of our implementation process with a seller and the building services is funding that effort in large part. 
And so we've seen a, a, a big drawdown on our reserves. Um, and so to the point where we need to address some of those structural inefficiencies. So we've, we feel like we can achieve that moving forward uh, in this direction based on the request that was provided to you. So um, if you have any further questions on the building inspectors, I'm happy to address those or I can pivot and go into the broader departmental piece. Go. Okay. Um, so uh, as Barry had alluded to, we've been working with our consultant, looking at the, the wide range of issues associated with how do we do our process improvements? How do we begin to meet the demands of our customer base? And, and it's really a broad customer base. It extends from you know, one side of the spectrum being the development community, um, and then the other side of the spectrum being those concerned neighbors, citizens, public participation, transparency issues. So we're trying to work through and make sure we can balance all competing interests with respect to those types of needs and desires, but do so as effectively and as efficiently as we can so that people can understand what the process is, how we can tee up for them. And I've worked a bit with our staff really to try to be the conveyors of setting options out on the table, making sure that our development community understands what their options are, understands uh, what they can do to move their project forward. And when they get involved in that decision-making process, they take ownership of it and they can understand the implications, both whether that's a time implication or a cost implication. So we're trying to do our part. A lot of what Jason described in the fee structures that we're requesting are really uh, an outpouring of some of this early feedback we've been getting with our consultant and with some of our development community. They want early assistance. They want the ability to come in to meet with staff, to document some of those early design drivers or decision points so that they can make those informed decisions. And so we found that we were committing a lot of staff resources to those early meetings. Um, and what we're trying to do is break them up in a way that, again, we can meet the interest of our customers, provide them that early feedback, let them make key design choices in their project, and then move forward accordingly. We're trying to be really the subject matter experts when it comes to those codes and ordinances that we have in place and show them where those, those choices exist. So that's really the, the broader philosophical approach and we're looking at different ways to implement that and as effectively as we can. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Bill? Commissioner Seal? Um, I more question probably for Blake, and this is like really getting in the nitty gritty. Right. But I'm trying to figure out how this pre-application fees that you're suggesting, how they all come together, because you had um, pre-application conceptual meeting fee of fifty dollars, a pre-application pre-submittal meeting of three fifty, and then you had two other. Uh, well, one was the consultant, but then you have a pre-application. Um, and other meetings. So are you gonna charge all these fees at one time? Well, um, no, what we're trying to do is take what currently exists, which is kind of a uh, one size fits all approach and break it down into subsections so that they can be a little bit more of an a la carte type of approach. So let me give you a context of how it works right now. If somebody wants to come in and do that pre-application meeting, we provide them a complimentary review. And that can be anything from the very conceptual, I, I have a property that I'm interested in, I don't know what I wanna do, and just kind of come at it from asking very broad-based questions. To the other end of the spectrum where you have somebody who really wants some technical guidance. They, they work through their submittal process, they wanna get one last check before they actually submit their project application. And we were committing um, a range of staff to those meetings. They're hour-long appointments. We do them Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and we were committing five and six staff members to those meetings, oftentimes four or five hours on those respective days. And so what we found is that it was, a, it was an inefficient use of staff time if it was really just the conceptual, because somebody just wanted to come in and ask a few questions. And that really could be achieved 
almost in a one-on-one -on -one setting or you know a conversation with somebody and not commit five or six staff members to doing that versus if you're going the other direction and you're trying to get technical responses to some of that stuff maybe that is appropriate so what that menu does within the fee structure is it says okay if you're asking for a conceptual we'll sit down and do a one-on-one -on -one with you and that's the that's the smaller fee um that's attributed to it if you want to go through that pre-submittal meeting and work through a checklist and get some real guidance on that we're going to provide that to you at a, at a greater a fee but we're going to roll those if those projects are uh, if those meetings turn into actual projects we're going to roll that into your your submittal cost. So we're not going to add an additional amount to you. We're just going to credit that amount and take it off of your, your submittal fee. But we also found that some of our customer base were trying to uh, design their projects through pre-application meetings where they'd come back in three and four and five times and try to, you know, try to circumvent the submittal process by doing this. And so we we wanted to be able to again recoup some of the costs in there so you'll see some of that come into play and then we also have a function whereby once we have taken in an application and we provided comments back to our customer base if they want to have a meeting with staff to sit down clarify all those comments go through the technical details we have the ability to set that so we've tried to create kind of a whole tiered structure of fees so that we can respond to what their need is, not charge them an, a, a broader overall amount, but really give them the opportunity to kind of select a la carte and do it that way. Okay. Is, do other municipalities do the same program? I mean. It is not uncommon to have the fees roll into um, the application process and many do charge an upfront cost. We find that some of the uh, folks, if they have a little bit more invested in the submittal, they'll come better prepared. They'll bring their design professionals to those meetings and, and we'll do some of that. This is one of the recommendations and early discussions that came out of that uh, consultant group uh, you know, discussion. So it is something that we've kind of evaluated with other communities and, and is not uncommon. It's not general practice across the industry but it's not uncommon okay Commissioners, so i think that if uh maybe uh we work with blake on putting together a process flow chart mm -hmm. um, that shows what the application process is along with the associated fees that might make it something visual that might make it a little bit more clear for everybody we're happy to do that and with all due respect we've had criticism and commissioner eggers kind of touched on it but we've had criticism of um, oh, we've gotten our comments back. Now you've added 30 more comments. So are we going to really try to streamline this to the point where they have a definitive answer and they can walk away knowing that um, things are on track and doing better? Yeah, and what we've done to that effect is we have basically now when you come into that pre-application, we have a very um, a published checklist of items that they go through. Uh, they walk away with meeting notes from those meetings. So if there are any action items or decision points that have been made, they can have something tangible to lead with. Um, as we go through the plan review piece of things, we have tried to restructure how we communicate those comments back. And what we have done is we've identified, okay, those items that, that require responses and action items, they have the ability to respond specifically to those. And if it's in many cases um, where they haven't efficiently responded to them, we will make a note in maybe a second round of review, you know, uh, previously addressed, you know, comment that's been made and it, it didn't get adequately addressed. So we'll try to draw that attention back to both the property owner and the engineer of records so we are really clear. Uh, our position is that many of those comments that come back that weren't generated the first time depend in part on what revisions they've made. So we're not, you know, unless it's something that we uh, inadvertently missed, we're not generating new comments, we're just responding to the, the design. So for example, if something comes in and says, okay, the first round of comments necessitated you redesigning the project in such a way that you're triggering something new that wasn't anticipated, yes, then we're gonna make that new comment. 
Um, and we will identify that in our response to, to do that. And we're, with Belinda's help, we're doing a lot more to track the individual groups that review this. Um, so while we were doing a little bit more of the tracking in a broader aggregate sense and saying, okay, how long does it take the entire group to respond? And we have those target timelines. We're now breaking them down by discipline so we can understand, okay, if um, you know, we might have six or eight different disciplines reviewing that site plan, we need to know where those pain points are. If this one particular group is repeatedly having trouble keeping pace with the rest and it's basically slowing down, then we can target some additional resources or, or see what we can do to address that specific point in the process. So we're trying to get a finer grain response so we can address the development community and their need. And we're also tracking um, the amount of time it takes our applicants to respond. Um, but, so but I will say that we're right now, because we are still in the middle of implementing Acela, some of the interior changes that we want to do are kind of lagging behind. So right now you've got, if you go there, they're going to give you a card. It's going to have five different departments on that card. Um, and, and so it's still very siloed integration of that process and getting to where you have one project manager that will help you through the entire process and everything else happens back office will be where we need to be. But we're not there yet. Um, and that until we get a consistency in the review and we empower the staff to um, to address problems and, and work through issues with people, there'll still continue to be issues like that. And so that's that's a key piece is issue resolution and consolidating down to single point accountability uh, and, and giving them the authority to resolve issues. But we're not there yet. We're getting there. And the staff's doing a really good job of trying to get there. And I've seen the way in which they're approaching it, and they're approaching it with the right attitude. They don't want these issues. It's, you know, they, they're trying to resolve those. Um, but that's also where the reg regulatory review comes in, because there's, I think, some changes that we can make as part of that that'll make it easier for people to comply. I mean, the reality is the sites we have left are difficult sites. <laughs> You know, right. and, and so, you know, stormwater, <laughs> Raheem used to say, don't blame anybody. I did it, you know, and, um, and we have a lot of, as we have, have we seen, we've had a lot of issues regarding some of those. And it's a real balance between environmental protection, you know, neighbors and uh, trying to have somebody have the ability to develop. Um, so they're but getting My final question is other than COVID, um, Isela is definitely off track, correct? I thought we were going to have that it, done. It is. Uh, it did take. There are a couple of things that resulted in some delays. One is that Acela actually went through an acquisition, and they we lost the project manager and the solutions architect. So we so Acela had to pivot and respond back to the county and try to to address some scheduling delays that occurred on their end of it. Um, we have also gone through the process on our end of it to make sure we reformat how we deliver that service. And so COVID has certainly had some bear on that. But I have to say, um, you know, Brian's OTI staff has been unbelievably dedicated. He has poured, poured a lot of resources into that. We've been trying to, because this is a, a bigger enterprise system and we've relying on a number of different departments. We're trying to continue to bring those folks involved, keep them involved along the way. Um, and so we do, right now we're on target for an October uh, go live. We're doing some, uh, we're in cycle four out of five potential cycles for some of our data transfers. We run into some really interesting dynamics in bringing some of that data, not necessarily over from Permits Plus, although that's part of it, but one of the things that we're seeing is that there was a lot of legacy data that came from the prior um, system into Permits Plus, which was called Deja Wind. And it's the conversion of those records so that when they were converted from Deja Wind into Permits Plus, and now we're trying to take them and convert them from Permits Plus into a CELA, we're running into some challenges there. And so we've been working with uh, OTI staff 
and our implementer Redmark, and they have done a quite a, a bit of a heavy lift to make sure that we can get that on schedule. But the goal is to have everything be transparent so that you can have that one-stop shop experience and you can see the history and the chronology of that property from a permitting perspective and get all of those records, see where the fees have come in, and then we can get a lot of the efficiencies that Barry alluded to earlier um, and make sure we can get back on track. So right now we're looking, if all goes well with the data cycles uh, and getting that moved over, we're looking at probably in October. We're gonna be going into some user training pretty heavily in July and then some user acceptance training. Um, we're trying to do a lot of the training protocols and shift over to uh, virtual training, which is adding a new degree of complexity rather than an in-office training and train the trainer mode. Uh, but it will pay dividends, we believe, in the long run because as we get new staff coming on board and we go to train the public, we'll have videos and other uh, virtual training sessions. So we wanna make sure we, we do it right first time so we can have that resource available to us long term. I don't know, Brian, did you have anything more you wanted to add on the OTI side? No, I mean, we're, we're looking at the same target date right now, sometime around October. Um, you know, Blake and his staff have worked incredibly hard through not only a tough business year, but also trying to balance the configuration of the software package. Um, I believe that we'll be there in October. Um, you know, this is kind of an interesting system because it's not only internal facing that we need to, you know, use the system to process our permits and things like that, but also we have the external facing component where we really need to bring the developer community along with us and make sure that that outreach is done properly. So I think we'll be there in October based upon where the schedule is right now. And just kudos to Blake and his team for all the effort they've put in. Mr. Riggers. Yeah, a, a couple of last comments uh, really um, kind of reflected the comments that I was going to make. Uh, I know that if, if everything was perfect, we'd just stop all the business coming in and take care of, you know, take care of these changes and then start up again. But I really wanted to commend your group, like with all that's going on, keeping that business flowing, even if it's not the way we want to eventually do it. Um, and um, the idea of having uh, an, um, kind of an, uh, an ombudsman person that kind of helps these folks through this, you know, what we might think is an easy process is kind of complicated. So um, I really appreciate it. Having, uh, you know, timely and accurate feedback, whether it's in the beginning, during, or towards the end and inspections are so critical. So keeping those inspectors and not losing them, it's really a big deal um, and making sure that we're giving good feedback. So. I'm glad we're heading in that direction. I think um, maybe in a couple of years, people will be talking about Pinellas County as the, uh, the model. Um, and then on a, on a lighter note, I was looking at your, um, uh, your org chart and I see site plan in red. Does that mean you want us to start doing site plan reviews at the commission level or no. is, that, is that just, that, I'm just kidding. Don't answer that, <laughs> no need to answer that. I just wanna make sure that Welch was listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a heart attack. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Blake. They were just testing you, Commissioner Eggers. <laughs> uh, my question is on Acela. How much legacy data are we transferring? In other words, how far back does the data go that we're transferring over? We have, um, we're actually meeting and working with the IG's office and the clerk to make sure that we can answer that question more definitively. The preliminary discussion is going back to essentially 2008. Um, that's when you saw the legacy data that came over from that, uh, that earlier system that Deja went, uh, happened around the 2005, 2006 timeframe. And they made some critical decisions when they moved that data over. So it's really when you get to 2008 where you don't have any of those legacy issues from Deja went and everything is much cleaner moving forward. That also gives us the ability that when we go live in 2020, that we will correspond back the 12 years that we require for record retention. So it can, it's consistent with some of the statutory building requirements for record retention. So that's kind of why we picked that date. Um, okay. The system will track it, will flag it, will identify where there may be a need to do a little bit more research, 
But in terms of that level of confidence and what we have moving forward, it's really that 2008 data and, and more recent. Okay. And you also mentioned on the analysis on page nine for building services, $422,000 reduction um, due to a seller. Is that timing or was it rescoped? There was a change in overall methodology. We went from, and Brian, you may have to help me with this one. We went from a, a, a waterfall methodology to an agile methodology. And so there was a, there was a little bit of better efficiencies gained in terms of how we were delivering some of that. Um, there's also been, you know, you too other, agile. Yes. Okay. As well, as I mean, just to, to clarify that a little bit further, because you're going to see a lot of this uh, spoken to when uh, Brian has his uh, budget presentation coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, but the way these projects work is there tends to be a focused effort with a lot of spending for the implementation. And once the implementation is done, then you're going to see a decrease in the cost allocation charges when we go into a maintenance mode. So what you're seeing reflected in 21 is the anticipated switch to a maintenance mode and the implementation being over. Yeah, the, okay. the project cycle had a five-year anticipated um, project life cycle. Bill's comments are absolutely right. The first two years, year zero and year one, which is we're at the end of that second year, mm -hmm. were really in the millions of dollars uh, for the first two years, and then it drops off into licensing and maintenance, and so it, it drops down substantially after that point. I think it's Five hundred or six hundred thousand dollars for years moving instead of in the million dollar range. And you're going to see a similar dynamic with the uh, EAM City Works project as well. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Blake. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Jason. Construction licensing. So Belinda and I will be guiding you through contractor licensing department as well. And we'll also be joined by Gay Lancaster, the department's director, and Michelle Krikovich, who is the uh, deputy director for the contractor licensing department. So let me share my screen and let me know when you're able to see it. Is everybody see able to see that? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, thank you. So again, contractor licensing department, uh, they do the day-to-day -day administration um, on behalf of the Pinellas County Construction Licensing Board. Um, they license uh, contractors within the county as well as do uh, investigations of complaints uh, for the complaints that they received um, on any unlicensed contractor activity. And I will hand it over to Belinda to discuss the performance aspects. Great. Thank you again, Jason. So the contractor licensing department is working to improve their customer and citizen experience. Um, they're doing that by replacing the current application that they use with the uh, Acela Civic platform. Uh, the current application that they're using was developed internally and it was written in an unsupported code and framework. So as a result, much of the department's current data collection efforts are very manual and very time consuming. Um, so again, Acela will enable the department to collect data in an automated system. Uh, the department has been making great strides to make improvements since becoming a department under the BCC. They've worked very hard to capture as much data as possible to assist in making informed decisions um, about every aspect of the department. So if we go down to the COVID performance impacts, since the contractors were unable to physically be in the office during COVID, the transaction volume decreased, even though the mail and online services were still available for them. Um, in spite of this reduction, revenue has increased compared to the same period last year. Um, in summary, the complaints increased overall during COVID. The department also began, began differentiating the types of complaints um, in the beginning of FY20 in order to distinguish and record that data on a more granular level. Um, department had been responding to complaints during the safer at home restrictions. Fewer calls were received during this period and the department has responded to those calls, having only a, one inspector in the field at a time. 
Now, the result of this was fewer complaints and the COVID restrictions means that the number of citations decreased compared to the same period last year. Um, so if there's no questions on this, I'll pass the discussion over to Jason. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, I would like to know, and I'm sorry I can't see. Belinda, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Do you have a projection of when you will be completely automated and you won't have to be doing the manual stuff anymore? Um, the Acela project, um, I might need your assistance with this, Brian or Gay. I'm not exactly sure. I don't have that information up when the Acela project is going to be implemented for contractor licensing. Mr. Long, we start. We literally started this project. I think it was around March, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, last month, so May. Uh, we've got about a 12-month project implementation schedule, which would put us into about May of 2021. Um, you know. Oh my. I mean, it just seems like we've been talking about this issue since before the county took it over. So it just is a little distressing to learn that it has taken this long to get it going. And there are some core reasons behind that. You know, the the, oh. the PCCLB project, and you'll hear also from animal services and uh, in the consumer protection, all three of those departments are going on to Acela. Um, but there are dependencies on the main project, which we just talked about commencing in October. And so we have to make sure that we're coordinating those dependencies between the main project and the other three departments that are going, going on onto a cell. When, when you approve, Commissioner, when you approve, and I asked the same question, when you approve the funding, you, when you approved the funding for this, you know, last year, um, they, they had to get in the queue to get on a cell. They couldn't begin it immediately. And and that oh. so it's so it's been lagging and waiting till they're further along with what they were doing with them as the Acela implementation before they could add animal um, services and uh, the licensing construction licensing board. So literally, there's they they were in the queue. They they couldn't proceed. All right. Well, then I have and I just have one more thing that occurred to me as we are listening to this report. And it seems to me that given the just ox that we all suffered through in getting this legislation passed to put the BCC under the, under the county, that it would be, I think it would be a really good thing for us to give a little report to the delegation when we do our joint meeting with them, whenever that might be, just so that they know that it's working because there was a lot of gnashing of teeth about whether or not that was the best way to go, if you remember. So uh, I hope I can get the support of my colleagues in thinking that that might be a very good idea. That's it, Madam Chair, thank you. Keep going. Okay, so moving on to opportunities for efficiencies within the department. Uh, contractor licensing is a participant within the pilot project that we've discussed previously. So they're working through that to determine those efficiencies. Um, the department's also proposing changing their timeline for their uh, licensing renewal. Currently it's um, at the end of the year over a three month period. Uh, they're looking to spread that out across the calendar year where it can be a more uh, level workload rather than so intense at the end of the year. Uh, they're looking to improve their insurance verification process. Um, continued work with the Office of Technology and Innovation to expand services um, and items that can be paid online. And as we've already discussed, uh, the implementation of Acela. Uh, the department does have one decision package for a temporary, adding a temporary um, staff member. This will be part of the department's compliance and enforcement team. Uh, they'll monitor advertising violations and be part of the department's collection efforts. It's anticipated to be a revenue generated, uh, generating position. 
Uh, that that's estimated at approximately one hundred and seventy thousand dollars of revenue generated, and the cost for that temporary position is just under sixty thousand dollars, and that includes any sort of computers or supplies needed. Potential threats to the department. Uh, there were a handful of bills that circulated uh, over the past year that did not move forward. So with those being able to potentially be reintroduced at a later date. On to the budget summary. We can see there are expenditure, revenues and expenditures and staffing summary remaining co uh, consistent at 12 full-time employee. Uh, revenues for fiscal year 21 are anticipated to, for licensing, increase by approximately $40,000 or 5%. Uh, again, as similar to the, the building services fund, as long as the construction industry remains strong, um, you know, that'll have positive impacts on the department's revenue. Uh, for their citations, that revenue stream is looking to increase at approximately $180,000. Um, and again, if the decision package moves forward, uh, an additional $170,000 would be added. Administrative fines increasing by uh, approximately $40,000. And the department's uh, continued to focus on improving its collections process um, and reducing the number of backlogged items. That will also increase, um, contribute to increased revenues. And, and on that one, commissioners, that's one where, again, we're carrying that at a certain point, if it's non-collectible, we're gonna have to write it off and start over, but they're not far enough into it to be able to, you know, say that, you know, here's the break off point, um, but we're, that's still a lagging cleanup item that they're working on. Onto the expenditures, the department's increasing uh, expenditures by approximately $149,000. Uh, personal services costs being almost $45,000 of that and operating costs um, being about $105,000. Uh, the department has an increased need for uh, sheriff deputies presence at some of their meetings uh, as well as in their lobby during that, that uh, license renewal season at the end of the year. Um, also with the increased number of transactions that the department processes, there are increased uh, postage and mailing. Um, expenditures, and also an increase to their general fund uh, cost allocation of approximately $106,000, and that goes to cover uh, things provided by other departments, such as communications, board records, or records management. The department does have an outstanding liability of uh, just under $300,000 that is own, owed to both uh, BTS fund and the general fund. So the department will continue to work with OMB to um, determine the timing of that, those repayments based on the fund stability. And that's the, that's the, un, uh, the outstanding um, collectibles. So at a certain point, we, so we said, you know, you, you had said, we'll pay for a Sulla. We said, that's fine. If the fund can carry it, in other words, we can collect backlog of, you know, half a million dollars or a million dollars or whatever of um, past due debt we can collect it great if not at a certain point we'll write that off and and then move on um, but they haven't got far enough to be able to de determine whether we it's collectible or not and lastly uh, the department is not proposing any changes to their user fee schedule for fiscal year 21 and as i mentioned we have uh, gay in the audience if we can field any questions for you No questions. Okay, you can at uh, least give them an Seale. update on yeah. what they're Sorry. doing. Commissioner Seal. Sure. Uh, just that I want to compliment Gay and the department. I know they've worked really hard and I want to note that I was not favorably inclined Commissioner Longport coming underneath the county commission's um, oversight, but we've had way few complaints than I expected. So. Uh, thank you, Gay. We have a wonderful staff, and uh, I think what we've done to 
improve our data collection has been significant. We're ready to get into a CELA. Uh, we're anxious to, as I know all of you are. Um, there's been good groundwork laid for that. Uh, Brian's department has been amazingly supportive and uh, I have to give huge kudos to Michelle Krikovich because she is the best data digger and analyst that I've ever come into contact with and we're lucky to have her in the department. We know so much more than we ever have about the way we're doing business and, and I'm proud to say that we're making progress by leaps and bounds. Um, revenues are up. Um, Every time we make a transaction, it's it's just a benefit to uh, the department and everyone is providing great customer service. They don't always love us because we're enforcement people, but um, we hope they at least like the service that we're providing when we do so. I know you know this, commissioners, but she walked into a situation where <laughs> oh, they, <we> know. <laughs> it was, I mean, well, even, even since I've been here, I mean, it was all manual and not even well done manually. <laughs> so to build that from scratch and to put that on a path is um, it's, it's, it's a huge lift. So. And I do want to say um, for the commission, I know you're concerned about outstanding uh, citations and, and uh, collectibles. And that has been an enormous task that Michelle has undertaken to at least quantify it. There's a lot of data that is um, questionable in our system, stuff from before you know, 2016 that we have to clean up and quantify, but we'll get that number to you. And, and I hope you'll be understanding that some of it uh, is so old uh, that we cannot probably expect to collect it, but at least we'll all know what it is and we'll be able to move on from there. Thank you, Gay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, next issue. Uh, I forget what the next issue is. It is uh, housing and community development. All right. Bill, who's up? John, you're up and uh, oh, you just unmuted yourself. Good job. Yep, just unmuted myself, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Ondervik. I'll be uh, out of OMB. And I'll be leading the discussion today for the housing and community development. And with me is Belinda Amundsen. She's going to do the SPM piece. And we also have Brian Lowack as the interim director. So for right now, I'm going to share my screen. And can everybody see that? Yep. Yep, sir. All right, and I will turn it over to Belinda to start the performance summary. Belinda, you may be muted. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so thank you again, John. Uh, this department is distinctive, uh, particularly in a lot of its data collection efforts. Um, so many of their initiatives are long-term and take quite a bit of time to yield some results, meaning it can take years for the effects of some of these efforts to be realized. Um, it's also due to the fact that so much of the data collected through this department is at a very high level and is outcome related information as it pertains to the community. Along the same lines, there are multiple departments that are working together to collect and catalog the metrics, um, especially related to initiatives such as health and all policies and the comprehensive plan um, which speak to the department's long-term initiatives and community outcomes. Um, John, if you can scroll down to the COVID portion. So the performance impacts from COVID, uh, the long-term impacts of COVID are gonna take a while to realize as the economy recovers and the recovery efforts shake out. There are a number of initiatives that have been affected by COVID. Um, the follow following initiatives have been um, experienced delays, and that is the Palm Harbor Master Plan, the Downtown Palm Harbor and Lillman Form-Based Code, um, the Penny for Affordable Housing Funding Process, and the Comprehensive Plan Update. Um, for the remaining initiatives, COVID has affected the methods and the appro approaches to these initiatives, but the end dates haven't changed. So for example, um, for Census 2020, that initiative 
It's still anticipated to be completed in September of this year, but uh, the Speakers Bureau presentations are continuing with through virtual platforms instead of in person. And the department is working with marketing communications to find alternative strategies for collateral distribution. Um, so if there are no questions, I'll pass this over to John for the COVID cares section. All right, thank you, Belinda. Uh, the COVID Cares Act um, Community Development Block Grant received additional funds of 1.4 million, and the Emergency Solutions Grant received an additional 739,000. And the amounts are budgeted to be split between FY20 and the first part of FY21. Uh, the funds are to be used uh, in response to the COVID-19 and activities that uh, provided food assistance and healthcare testing were given priority. Um, they are in the process of the applications and um, more to come on that. And there's the breakouts between the two years. And opportunities for efficiencies. Um, the planning section design, uh, was able to eliminate the annual general fund subsidy of 739,000. Uh, basically what they're gonna do is use existing funds that have accumulated over the years to offset that. They eliminated a couple of positions for the uh, planning analyst positions that were funded by the general fund. And because they're able to use staff from community development and the Lealman CRA, um, within planning, it helped reduce uh, the overall costs of everything. Potential threats um, because of the COVID-19 and the uh, economic downturn, the future property tax valuations and the Lealman CRA area could be impacted and uh, may, um, have, may impact the ability to implement the CRA plan. Now the housing and community development is three programs. It's got the planning, which is general funds. Uh, their requ total request is 3.197, uh, which is about 101,000 greater than the FY20 budget. And that's basically the increase is that we had an office specialist two position that was no longer needed. And that was uh, create, that created a new position for our planning division manager. So that's the additional cost for the increase in budget. <clears throat> and like I had mentioned earlier, the planning department's general fund is about 247,000 in salary and benefits that uh, use personnel from the community development fund and the Lima Sierra fund to do planning program projects. Uh, department work plan, uh, it's directly associated with budget funds and there's a list of them there. This is in their uh, personnel services, I'm sure, sorry. This is in their professional services. Uh, we have the US 19 Priority Investment Quarter, uh, which is 100,000. There's a new affordable housing consultant for 78,005. Um, High Point Plan, 20,000. CRA Funding Research is 25,000. And the Housing Strategy Research is 25,000. And the Mobile Home Park is about 20,000. And I had mentioned earlier that the general fund subsidy for FY21 uh, was eliminated and they're gonna use the lapsed funds for prior years. That is uh, set in fund 1009, which is a community development fund. And commissioners on that, the $78,000 uh, for the consultants, Tom Kennedy, um, that's that's the, basically the deal maker. So we know that we're gonna, we wanna push affordable housing. We need to make those projects happen. He's got a lot of experience in that. We, we want to use that as an outsourced way of going out and generating activity uh, and making uh, projects come to fruition. So that's uh, that's the way in which we're augmenting staff to be able to push and, and advance that, that whole strategic goal. Thank you. Uh, for the community development program, the community development program consists of three funds, which is the community development grant program, the State Housing Initiatives Partnership, which is SHIP, and the Community Housing Trust. Their combined budget is 28,800,950, and that also includes the um, funds that were received for the COVID Act for the emergency events. Um, all, the grants, all the available grants funds are budgeted, 
So there is no budgeted reserves. Uh, the big thing with this is, is that the SHIP program typically receives around 700,000 a year and they're expecting to receive 5 million from the state of Florida for FY21. The Lealman CRA Trust total budget is 3,149,300. Um, that includes um, TIFs for FY21 of 1.6 million and an estimated carryover from prior years of 1.4 million for FY20. Um, in FY21, they've created, well, currently we've created two new cost centers to track expenditures between the MSTU TIF and the county TIF. And that gives us a better idea of what monies are being spent for which bucket. And the grants and aids budget is the fund is reflective of the work plan and the budgeted funds for professional services within Lealman include the strategic plan, the ally study and the action plan. The staffing summary overall, you can see that the overall for the entire department is down to staff, which is the two planning positions that were eliminated from the general fund. Uh, for FY21, there was no changes in uh, the user fees and there are no decision packages for uh, this department. And is there any questions that we can answer? Yeah, Madam Chair? Yes. Barry, I know we have a, uh, a RFP or some kind of planning proposal out on the street. W what is our timeline for getting that back? And um, it, when are we going to start spending some money? So the, the RFP is exactly that, to be able to begin to spend money. Um, and so the, um, that's the first round. So we began collecting money in January. Um, the group uh, that you appointed, the, I forget the name of the group, um, the joint review, um, they, they brought you the recommendations in terms of the criteria. Now we use that criteria to put a RFP out on the street. They're due, um, Jill, do you remember? Um, I, I forget when they're due coming up here. It, it's not too far off. Um, I'll get you I'll get you the date on that. Uh, but they're due coming up here. We'll have a review of those. Um, and and so we should have that first round this year um, of um, projects that we would then approve to be, you know, for them to move forward. What, well, not only that, that sounds like the land assembly or the, um, the the property committee that we put together for criteria. So that's the criteria we, I thought we had put out a, like a, a master plan for the Lillman for the Heights. Oh, yeah, Dif different RFP. <laughs> yes, um, we did. And um, that was completed. So I'm gonna have to get, um, it's, it's the reviewing the applications or the, Sorry, I'm talking to Jill and she's not on here. So, so the applications are being reviewed right now. So we did put an RFP out from, from people submitting to be able to build on those vacant parcels that, that you had assembled over the years in Lelman. Um, we have applications received and it's, they're under review right now. So they'll be bringing a recommendation in terms of uh, who they recommend you contract with um, to make those projects happen. I, I think as part of that, when that comes in, I guess, but also uh, the the Heights project you just talked about, but then just in general, the CRA itself, um, to have that kind of money sitting there when it's supposed to be out in the community is, is a little frustrating, but um, I, I know there were some delays in there that were uh, not yours. Um, so I'm not trying to throw it on, on you, but- Oh, it's on us, I mean, it, it was- It's it it quite it a while now, it took us a year to get an RFP together and put it out on the street. It's ridiculous. It shouldn't have happened, and we're fixing it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Just wanted to congratulate Brian Lowak for his new position. We haven't seen you, but I know you'll do great things there. Thank you. For our, should I say, for your additional position. <laughs> right. <laughs> going to take over half the county by the time you're done, Brian. <laughs> Well, I'm enjoying meeting the team and, and they've got some exciting initiatives going on over there. Um, some of them have been hanging out there for a little while and over the next few months, our focus is really gonna be uh, emphasizing a, a few of those priority issues and making sure that we get them through the finish line um, within the next few months and some of the longer ones, including the comprehensive plan, 
uh, the Penny Four Affordable Housing Fund, um, you know, certainly by the end of the year. So we're right. looking forward to working together. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Commissioner Welch. Uh, just a real quick question. Uh, can we get a recap on the expenditures from the CRA? The one point uh, three million for FY twenty. I know it's probably been sent to us, but can we just get a recap on that sent out? Or is that is that anticipated, or have those projects actually been funded and implemented? I'm seeing one point three uh, for the FY twenty budget. Those are anticipated um, by the end of the fiscal year. I can send you a breakdown of what has been completed and yeah. uh, what we anticipate still completing. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Mills Planning Council. And I will also be leading that discussion. Um, I will uh, now uh, share my screen. Okay, Oops. wrong screen. Sharing. Try one more time, John. It just went away. Yeah, I saw that. So I'm trying to find it again. Windows share and well, that's not it either. There we go. Can you see that? Nope. No. John, you want me to get this shot for you? Yeah, I have it open. I just can't find the correct one to pull up. Perfect. Thank you. That? Yep. All Looks right. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, John, I'll do the best I can to uh, keep up with you. Okay. Uh, can you scroll down some, please? All right. PPC is a district. Um, is a dependent agency of Pinellas County. Um, the budget summary itself uh, reflects that the revenues from abalone taxes are going to be about 1.26 million, which is about 4.2% increase. The total overall revenues of 2.8 is going to be an increase of 2.7%. Uh, there's a slight increase in the personnel service of 4%. The revenues also include uh, 1.58 million for the PPC charging the MPO for costs associated with providing MPO support services. Um, and for the expense side, contractual services are reduced by 309,000. There's two programs that will continue, which is the planning and the placemaking grant program and the Safe Streets Pinellas Initiative Gateway. Oh, I'm sorry, initiative, okay. And can you scroll down some more, Bill, please? Keep going, keep going. All right. That's good, that's good. All right, they also receive approximately $10,000 um, in revenues from uh, supporting local governments. Uh, they conduct special planning studies and um, like building scales and, mass, and uh, massing studies for the waterfront area for the Gulfport later in the summer. Um, on the expenditure side, the PPC plans to continue, like I said, the planning and uh, placemaking grant program. Um, uh, it's to assist local governments in their work to maintain and strengthen the character of Pinellas County's many district communities. Uh, they're also staying with uh, working with the Safe Streets Pinellas Initiative for FY21. And it's the Vision Zero strategy to eliminate all traffic uh, fatalities and uh, any kind of severe energy, energy, 
injuries in Pinellas County while still increasing safe, healthy, and equitable mobi mobility for all. Um, the reason why these are the only two programs that are going to be um, worked on in FY21, um, the board had had a um, thought about increasing their millage. And because of the COVID-19, they said it would not be a, a good time to increase millage and they had to reduce their budget to kind of offset that. Their reserves, our, re our requirement is 10%. Um, it's they're, you, they use the contingency line, which is above the line and add that to their um, fund balance. And based on the FY21 request, uh, the level should be around 84,630 to make that 10% reserve, and they're at 266,840, so that's 32%, and that's compared to the FY20 reserve that were at 57% or 843,287 last year. Um, since the P PC is a dependent agency of the Board of County Commissioners, the format of their account structure is different than what the BCC uses. And if there's any questions, I can try to under, um, answer them for you. Or you can just go to web. Any questions? Okay. Hey, Whit. Hello, good afternoon. I guess you're on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a whole lot to add. Uh, we feel like we're heading in a good direction and um, we have chosen this year to not request a millage increase just because of the reasons John mentioned, uh, but we have um, uh, a lot going on and uh, we are keeping very busy working both regionally uh, and with all 25 local governments in Pinellas County. And I feel like we've got adequate reserves to handle our needs this year uh, and presumably next year as well. Okay, any questions for Whit? Okay, well, that was simple. <laughs> all right. No questions means I answered all your questions before. That's right. right. Uh-oh, uh, Commissioner Long. Wait, you shouldn't have said that last part. Um, and this is just more of a clarification or an inquiry. Are there any parts, because I recall that the Safe Streets Initiative was brought to the Regional Planning Council as well. And I'm just curious about whether or not there might be duplications of efforts going on there between what you do on your side and what the Regional Planning Council does on their side. Because a lot of the members of our, a lot of the cities in our county are members of the Regional Planning Council as well. Mm -hmm. well, I don't believe so. I, I'm, I'm not aware of the Regional Planning Council conducting a Vision Zero effort. So our focus is on building a coalition between law enforcement, uh, technical engineering and planning, and uh, local government elected officials, uh, as well as an educational campaign to really drive down uh, what we call uh, KSI uh, uh, incidents, which are killed and serious injuries on our roadways. And uh, the Regional Planning Council is certainly a great partner, but their scope is so much broader because they cover multiple counties. And we're really driving down deep into uh, priority issues that we need to address here in Pinellas County. We know Vision Zero is a lofty goal and, and we don't realistically expect to have zero fatalities on our road, but the vision uh, is important. And we, will, we do set targets every year for what, uh, what we expect to reduce in terms of fatalities and uh, crashes on our roadways. In fact, the last three months, they're down 50%. So I don't believe there's any duplication of effort um, going on, uh, but the Regional Planning Council is an important partner in helping us accomplish the goal. All right, well, just thank you for that clarification. I, I'm glad we, I asked the question. Thank sure. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that concludes our departmental presentations, Barry. It does. Um, for today. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Long, I know you wanted to bring something up. I did. And I know it was unexpected for everyone, but considering 
the state of our county, our cities, and what's going on across the country and the world, I thought it at least was an opportunity for us to do or say something uh, because we have not taken a real stand or made any real comment on these issues. And I think that's a big mistake. So I just bring it up for whatever it's worth to anybody else on the commission to hear your thoughts and what you think. I know it certainly kept me up and has for the last several nights. So I didn't want to be awake alone. Mr. Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I thank you, Commissioner Long. I, I just uh, sped read your letter, uh, <laughs> your memo. I think I said that right. Uh, Justice will tell me if I said it wrong. Um, but I, I certainly share your sentiments. And I do think um, the commission, I think by our actions, uh, has you know, perpetually made statements about what we believe in terms of equity and fairness. Uh, it would also be helpful for us to make an, some kind of official statement as well. I, I concur with that. Um, I think many of you know that I made a statement with um, the Black elected officials yesterday. Um, primarily because of the way this issue started with uh, George Floyd's uh, murder. But uh, as we all know, this is not a black issue. This is a community issue. Uh, and you can see that it needs to be a broader uh, conversation. The issue of police misconduct, though, has had a disproportionate impact on the black community. And that's why I went ahead and, and uh, participated in making that statement. Uh, looking at your three points, um, and just in speaking with elected officials and law enforcement and the public over the last few days, there are a lot of good thoughts and ideas about how we move forward in terms of dialogue and, and potential policy changes. Uh, I would just recommend that needs to happen in really a collaborative way. I know that uh, Mayor Christman is working on that same concept of some kind of a work group or, or follow up meeting to get community ideas. I would suggest that we collaborate with Mayor Christman and also with mayors uh, in other parts of the county because each part of our community has some different issues beyond the overarching issue of police conduct. Um, but I know that Sheriff Walter has mentioned he's open to that and he knows that there needs to be some rebuilding of community trust with law enforcement even though that particular issue did not happen here in Pinellas County, um, there is a lot of uh, angst and anxiety about the overall issue. So I think if we collaborate with uh, mayors and other leaders and just have a really structured and strategic um, path when we do have this kind of, uh, this kind of meeting uh, going forward. But uh, I do think we need to make uh, some kind of a statement as a county commission uh, as to what we believe, just uh, stating what we've always stated, but do it uh, in some kind of a official document right now. I think that would be appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will be glad to draft something. I gave um, Whitney something this morning to respond to people who are sending us emails and such, but um, if I could run it all by you all, well, I can't do that. I saw Jewel perk up when you said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind. I just wanted to make sure you were awake, Jewel. <laughs> um, well, perhaps Barry and I can work on something and uh, send it out to the Times, perhaps a, a column that they'd be willing to publish from all of us. And if you have thoughts about that, you can send me a one-way email, right? Uh -huh. Okay. Well, Madam Chair, you have my thoughts in the letter that, right. that we sent out yesterday. Absolutely. Um, but I, you know, I would also say that um, we need to send a message, I believe, out to folks that we are listening. Right. But the protests that are happening now have to be peaceful protests. There were more than 20 people arrested last night. Right. Um, St. Pete PD, the Sheriff's Department, and other local law enforcement are all pitching in. Uh, we saw US-19 uh, shut down in South St. Pete 
actually in North St. Pete last night. I understand there was uh, some attempts to shut down the interstate. I mean, that is not helpful. Um, we get to dialogue quicker if folks have peaceful protests. We are listening. And, and everybody is, I think, on the same page that we need to have more dialogue and talk about what additional policy changes need to happen uh, so that everybody feels safe. Right. And I would also be glad to contact uh, Mayor Kreisman and see what he's got planned and see if he'd like to do something jointly with us or jointly with other elected bodies. Okay. So, um, yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think uh, Commissioner Welch, your statement yesterday was uh, uh, with the others was incredibly well written. Um, and as you're reaching out, Madam Chair, uh, Mayor Hibbard put out a really nice statement yesterday as well. Um, so there's folks that want to be involved in this discussion. And I was listening to a presentation yesterday by Reverend Pritchett. And uh, it, what really struck me, what he talked about goes to what Commissioner Welch was talking about earlier, that if we have that trust in those relationships throughout the year, when times are good, when times are fine, that when there are these times of crisis, we have the foundation to solve the problem of the day. And so um, hopefully, like uh, Ken, like you said, that's the message we've been sending throughout the policies and the budget items that we do. Uh, but unfortunately, there's times where you have to look out the window and say, yes, we actually know the sky is blue. We recognize that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, that's where we're at today. Uh, Commissioner Seal, did I see your hand? Yes, you did. And um, thank you all for um, caring and believing that we can make this county an even finer place to live for everyone. And um, I was thinking based on, uh, Commissioner Welch, I saw your comments in the article this morning about um, Unite Pinellas. You know, there was a plan there that I'd like to have Tim work with Healthy St. Pete Foundation, with Randy and with JWB, because everybody has kind of collectively been working on specific plans. We need to get those three groups together and then lay out a more firm plan of what we could do together as a county across the cities and across the county. So it would kind of take one of the ideas, Commissioner Long, that you had in your memo and try to put it into construction, constructive action, because um, we know what we looked at when we looked at the five areas of um, poverty impact zones. JWB has done a lot of updates on that and some policy changes. Um, we were getting ready to do our strategic plan with JWB, but that was delayed obviously because of the COVID. Um, but I believe, and there may be other um, agencies that you would want to suggest, but we can have them, like I said, work together and try to march forward, arms linked together to really make some constructive changes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll work on that. Okay. What else? Madam Chair, one programming note for tomorrow's budget session and Fridays, I will be away from the office. You'll probably have Dana Zordon and or Brian Brennick from OTI that will facilitate our uh, Thursday and Friday's meeting. Brian, I'm not sure we can do this without you. Oh, yes, you can. I promise. <laughs> You've been keeping us on track. You're doing a wonderful job. Commissioner we Seal. <clears throat> um, one last uh, for tomorrow, the 10-year penny plan that um, has 10 pages and color coded. Is that the same one, Barry, that we had previously or has this been changed? Because I may want to have it printed if it's a change. It, it is, this is updated. It's gonna give you um, much more um, specific recommendations regarding where projects fall. It also um, will reflect um, revised uh, revenue projections. Okay, would you mind having that printed this afternoon? Uh, sure. Okay. Sure, we can do that. I would imagine that most of the commissioners would like to have that in hand for tomorrow. Thank you. Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, uh, first of all, Commissioner Long, thank you for um, 
being up at two or three o'clock in the morning and putting some thoughts together. I think we've all been wrestling with this um, in, in so many different ways as we look at what's going on across our country and um, and then obviously bringing it closer to home. And some of the comments that you all have made about, you know, there's a lot of good work that has been going on um, in this county, whether it's, you know, in Clearwater, St. Pete or anywhere else. Um, and I think that's some good things to build on and to, to, to refresh some of those things. Um, but I do think there is something about what, you know, Ken, you said about some kind of immediate statement. I think it's important. We got a lot of talk and, and thinking to do and maybe improving on some things, but I agree. I think the letter's a great idea. So uh, I really appreciate that, uh, throwing that out there last night in the middle of the night and, and letting us at least have a little opportunity to chat about it. Um, I do think each community is unique and so when we start having the, you know, maybe a community discussion, um, it can start, you know, kind of a, as a county thing and then kind of get into each each community. I know the mayors have probably talked about it today. But did they have a meeting today? I think they did a virtual meeting. Probably they're talking about it as well. So we've got some real leaders in this in this in this county that I know that would like to be at the table. Um, Barry, I know that the governor came out with an order today. Are, are we going to talk about that uh, tomorrow or Friday? I mean, obviously it starts Friday. So can you just give a little synopsis of your thoughts on that? Sure. So the governor um, moved us to phase two, effective Friday. He also extended our ability to have virtual meetings uh, through the end of June. Uh, what phase two means for um, us is, and I'm scrolling down here, um, So this means that restaurants um, are allowed to go to bar top seating so the bar areas can open. Uh, bars and pubs can open at 50% capacity. Retail establishments may open at full capacity with social distancing. Gyms full capacity with social distancing. Entertainment, including concert houses, movie theaters, which I thought were open, but bowling alleys at 50%. Um, and um, I guess these are betting facilities. Um, yeah, paramutual. So they're the betting facilities, they can open personal services. Um, again, they go by the department uh, regulations, but there is a phase two opening. It says you can, they're moving to that. And uh, so it's uh, the next phase of this plan. Did you say bars are open now? That is correct. The, the, miss, the real missing piece to this, I mean, you know, as we've talked about before, it's very confusing, but uh, the, the piece is it's very explicit in here is that bars can open at 50% and also the restaurant bar. So, you know, in the past, if you went into a restaurant, you had a bar area, the, the area directly on the bar was closed. Now it can open. Um, so that's the, that's the change from before, but also, um, the even the restaurants and and again it's not I'm just pulling up what they just sent out that's not clear but I think the restaurants are at 75 percent if I recall right from the phase two order and, and at, at first blush you don't see anything there that that you're that we'd be more restrictive on I mean I don't I don't I don't hear anything there that that would well we don't have anything that we're we're not under we're st simply under the governor's orders we don't have any any local restrictions we're following the governor's order and so unless there's something that we feel the governor has loosened up too much um which again my initial plus one this doesn't surprise me and two our numbers i think support this um is that we then we would have to take an additional action um so absent additional action it's simply goes and by the governor's order and is effective Friday. Just on, on those, you mentioned the numbers. Um, I think it's important that our you know residents understand the numbers that you're looking at as your team's looking at that percent positive number. The actual mm -hmm. number of cases seems to have bumped up in the last few days, four or five days, but the percent positives continue in a, you know, kind of a downward, downward uh, direction. So, yeah. so maybe, maybe, Maybe you could speak a little bit to to that issue and where we are from your perspective. Sure. So, you know, obviously we know that as we do more testing, um, as they, then we're going to see more pot in the number of positive cases going up. Um, but still, in a population of a million, you know, counties, we're we're receiving, you know, at the highest 35 cases, you know, uh, in a day. 
um, and at the lowest, you know, down into the 15 cases per day. So, you know, and then, you know, if you look at the percentage of overall positive, it's less than 2% of the people tested are uh, coming up positive, more like one and a half percent, depending upon the day, but as a high of, you know, in the mid two two percent. So very, very low numbers in terms of the percentage of the population. Um, we're not seeing in, with the with the changes that have occurred during phase one, um, a spike or anything that concerns us. Um, our concern is where we have our um, most likely ability for it to spread and which is in a confined facility and that is in our nursing homes. And we've discussed in depth the aggressive measures that not only us but the state is taking to make sure that we're inspecting every facility, we're um, testing all the, all the staff and the residents um, and making sure that we do everything possible to, to min mitigate or, or minimize or prevent the spread within our nursing homes. Yeah, just one last thing, uh, Madam Chair. I think that's a great point, Barry. And maybe as time goes on, we can kind of pull, pull together what we actually have done on our own, but also in conjunction with the state and make a statement to our residents, uh, the get kind of the state of the industry. Um, I mean, I know it's not our, per, it's not under us, but I do think there's a, there's, there's a, a lot of concern right now with, with that, you know, long-term care facilities. There's been incredible uh, improvements, uh, made a lot of strides. Our fire department's been out there checking and, and you know, you, we've got done a lot of things. And I think that's going to be a really important element um, as we, as we move forward. And the fact that I think you mentioned yesterday that the state's doing about 4,000 tests in those nursing homes. So we might see a little bump in numbers again. So from a perspective standpoint, when you're looking at the numbers over the next few days, those numbers will start coming out as well. And they tend to be a, the industry where we're having a few more of those, those cases. So, but I do like the progress we're making uh, with those, those, those long-term care facilities. We've got a ways to go, but um, yeah, it's, it's almost a, done it's with the, with the testing. I'm, I, I'll tell you, they've been very aggressive and our, our fire and EMS folks, just amazing. They've done um, literally hundreds, if not, I think it's over a thousand inspections, um, but they're, they think they were down. I think the last report I had was like four facilities remaining to do a first inspection. And that was really a coordination issue uh, more than anything else. So um, again, we've just put sec set a second set of eyes, um, collaborated, with both the hospital CEOs and with the nursing home and long-term care facility CEOs uh, to uh, to make sure that we you know we have proper um, coordination and oversight within these facilities. Thanks, Barry. Mr. Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have the same question as Dave did about the uh, governor's order, so I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, anything else? Barry, I will send you something later when okay. I put my head to this. Yeah, um, I need to talk with you also. Just to, I'll just plant the seed. We um, So we have our emergency order extended through the 12th. Um, we need to extend that. Um, so I need to collaborate with Joel. Can we do that on Friday? But that would be more than a week away. We may need to have just a quick special meeting next week that would then pass it for the following week, so the 12th through the 19th. We actually we have a work session on the, that week, to, you know, to to be able to act upon. So we may need a special time um, to meet, you know, just quickly to pass the emergency order. How many people are going to the fact conference? Well, it's it's virtual. Oh, yeah, oh. everything's virtual. NACO's virtual. Yeah. Fact okay. virtual. <laughs> <We'll be here. laughs> Never mind. <laughs> it all changed. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah, not going anywhere, huh? Yeah. Nope. Okay. All right. We will do that. I guess we're adjourned then. Thank, Thank you, so you much. Madam Chair.